uh, the video will be played in three, two, one. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good morning, selamat pagi. We wish to welcome the Honorable President of International Law Association, Indonesian Branch, and the Head of International Law Department, Faculty of Law, Universitas Pajajaran, Professor Atip Latipul Hayat, the Honorable Keynote Speaker, Speaker, Professor Tomiko, former president of the Conference on the Law of the Sea and the chairman of the Center for International Law at National University of Singapore. The honorable discussants, namely Mr. Lowell Bautista, PhD, senior lecturer and head of postgraduate studies, School of Law, University of Wollongong, Australia, and Mr. Guzman Siswandi, PhD, Assistant Professor and the Vice Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Pajajaran. The Honorable Moderator, Mrs. Chlorine Tri Isana Dewi, LLM, Lecturer of Faculty of Law, Universitas Pajajaran, and the Honorable Participants. A very good morning to all of you. Welcome to the International Association Indonesian Branch Dialogue, Mohtar and the Law of the Sea, How Indonesia Became an Archipelagic State. My name is Renata and I will be your master of ceremony for this event. It is a privilege and a great honor to have the presence of this international lecture and on behalf of the host, we would like to extend our greatest appreciation to each and every one of you for being able to attend this this event. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me first and foremost to inform you of this morning program. Today, there will be a prologue delivered by the President of International Association Indonesian Branch and followed by a general lecture delivered by Professor Tomiko. And after that, there will be two discussions which will be discussed by Mr. Lowell Bautista, PhD, and Mr. Guzman Siswandi, PhD, followed by a question and answer session. And before the first session starts, please allow me to explain some of the meeting guidelines. First of all, please mute your audio during the sessions and you may activate your audio during the Q&A session. Second, we recommend you to activate your video. Third, Please follow the instruction to change your username, which is your institution underscore your name. And fourth, you may deliver the questions through the chat box. And if you wish to deliver it directly, please use the raise hand function in the participants menu. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on to our next agenda, we will have a prologue delivered by Professor Atip Latipul Hayat. In that case, please allow me to introduce Professor Atip Latipul Hayat. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Atip Latipul Hayat is a professor of international law. 
and the head of international law department, Faculty of Law, Universitas Pejaran. And he is the president of International Law Association Indonesian branch. And his field of expertise are international law, air and space law, the law of international treaty, human rights law, and the theory of law. He has published books and articles in the area of international law, both in national and international journals. And ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Atip Latifu Haya. Professor Atip, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Renata. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, as the presidents of the International Law Associations, the branch of the Indonesia, and also the head of International Department, uh, Faculty of Law, Pajaran University, uh, I welcome you all to International Law Association Dialogue with the special topic today, how Indonesia became an archipelagic state. This event is dedicated to Professor Mohtar Kusumat Maja, former prime minister of the Republic of Indonesia, former rector of University of Pajajaran, and former head of delegations to the conference on the law of the sea, who has passed away on 6th of June this year. We are honored that this seminar is attended by Honorable Professor Tomiko, former president of the Conference on the Law of the Sea. So today we can obtain uh, the significant information from the first hand from Professor Tomiko. Professor Ko is our main speaker today who will discuss the genesis of archipelagic state from declaration to conventions and specifically explains how we Indonesia became an the archipelagic state. I would also like to thank Dr. Lowell Bautista, head of postgraduate studies, School of Law, University of Wollongong, Australia, as our discussions of this seminar, which will specifically discuss the impact of acceptance, the concept of archipelagic state into the law of the sea, to other archipelagic states such as uh, Philippines. And last but not least, my colleague, Dr. Guzman Chato Siswandi, the director of Indonesian Center for Law of the Sea, which will discuss strengthening the Indonesia's maritime diplomacy as the largest archipelagic state challenge and opportunities. <clears throat> the nations know we call Indonesia was not born as an archipelagic state. Until the middle of the 1950s, nearly all the waters lying between the islands of Indonesia were as open to the ships of all nations as were the waters in the middle of the great oceans. These waters belonged to no state, nor did any state claim any form of jurisdiction of them. As a consequence, Indonesia was made up of hundreds of pieces of territory separated from one another by high seas. Then suddenly on 13 December, 1957, the cabinet of uh, Prime Minister Juanda Kartavijaya declared that the Indonesian government had absolute sovereignty over all the waters lying within straight base lines drawn between the outermost islands of Indonesia. This was line encompassing as they did all the islands making up the country from Indonesia. Its land and the seas over which the government now asserted sovereignty into a single unified territory for the first time. Professor Mokhtar has succeeded in expanding the Indonesia's territory so that it became the largest archipelagic state and a state with longest coastline in the world. Instead of using ballot, he applies the principles of international law. In his seminal book, Pengantar Hukum International, or Introduction to International Law, which was published in 1976, Mohtar admitted that his understanding of law, especially international law, was mostly influenced by two of his students at Yale Law School, Professor Mertz McDougall and Professor Northrop. 
McDougall, who is known as the father of policy-oriented approach to international law, views law, especially international law, as a political product that forms a synergistic relationship that gives positive effects between the two, influencing and strengthening each other. Meanwhile, Northrop that introduces the concept of living law argues that relations between countries must be based on an effective international legal system, that is international law, which is able to provide effective solutions of their international problems. Mokhtar's approach to international law was confirmed when he represented the government of Indonesia in Bremen court in 1959. This case was triggered by the Indonesian government policy of nationalizing the Dutch companies, mostly in the view of plantations. The Dutch government asked Indonesia to pay compensation based on the principle of prompt, effective, and adequate. Indonesia rejected the Dutch argument because the nationalization was carried out with the aim of changing the economic structure from colonial to national economy. Indonesia did not reject for paying compensation, but modified its implementation, which is not fully based on the principle of prompt, effective, and adequate, but made some adjustment with the economic policy of Indonesia as a new country. The Bremen court agreed with and accepted the Indonesian arguments. In this regard, Mohtar said as follows. When a state gives consent to be bound by international law, it does not mean that the state cannot protect its national interests through national legislation. International law, according to Mokhtar, should provide solution to many international problems and not make itself as a rigid set of norms. The Indonesian archipelago is a unit of land and waters and that the sea between the island is an art is an inseparable part of the land of the Indonesian state. The word Tanah Air in Bahasa Indonesia is strong evidence that this concept has concisely penetrated the minds of the Indonesian people. Based on this concept, the archipelagic state may draw states archipelagic baseline joining the outermost spines of the outermost islands. Mohtar said as follows, in our language, as in many languages, we have a word for a native country. The French word is patrie, the German word is de heimat. In Indonesia, it is land, water, which means land and water. Most of the ideas were in the same frequency as the effort and policies of the government at the time to make the concept of an archipelagic state becoming international norm. There are two fundamental government political decisions namely the Juanda Declaration on December 13, 1957 on the Indonesian waters and the promulgation of law number 4, 1960 concerning Indonesian waters, which was substantially reinforcements of the Juanda Declaration. The purpose and substance of the two governments' political decision cannot be separated from Indonesian participations in the two United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea uh, in Geneva in 1958 and 1960, where Mokhtar was a member of the Indonesian delegation at both conferences. The history finally told us that Mokhtar was a figure who later became the main actor of how the concept of honor capitalistic state was fought for almost 25 years, where Mokhtar had to convince other countries of the concept. Mokhtar realized that the concept of an archipelagic state was only the interest of a small number of countries, including Indonesia. While the big countries, including the United States, strongly opposed the concept. Mokhtar also realized that the law of the sea was bound in values of Western Europe, so that the concept of archipelagic state proposed by Indonesia would be considered as an unnecessary historical deviation in this context, it is, is interesting to note what Mokhtar said as follows. So I submit that in studying international law and law of the sea in particular, if, if we want a truly international view to evolve, we should not base it only on what evolved in Western Europe.
Mohtar is very persistent and detailed in explaining the concept of archipelagic state in various international forums, especially at the United Nations. For example, in the third conference on the law of the sea in Caracas in 1974, Mohtar said, Mr. President, thus, an archipelago must be a group of islands grouped together in real sand. An archipelago, therefore, must be distinguished from a chain of islands. Mohta realized that there were several problems related to the concept of this archipelagic state, both technical and legal. This concept can also be understood and approached in a multidisciplinary manner. While on the other hand, major maritime countries such as the United States are quite consistent in rejecting this concept. Mohtar is confident and optimistic that this concept will eventually be accepted. Mohtar said diplomatically as follows, I hope you agree with me, but even you do not agree, I hope at least that you understand. Mohtar's efforts were finally successful with the signing of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982 in Montego Bay, Jamaica on December uh, 1982, which among other things recognized the concept of archipelagic state that Mohtar had fought for almost 25 years and Indonesia had ratified the conventions with law number 17, uh, year 1985. Thank you very much. We would like to express our gratitude to Professor Atip Latipul Hayat for the remarkable prologue. Therefore, to keep this wonderful moment, we are going to have a photo session together. Ladies and gentlemen, please activate your video. All right. Uh, if you're ready, so we are going to take the photo together. Smile for the picture in three, two, one. One more time. Three, two, one. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now we will continue to the next session. And this session is going to be chaired by Mrs. Chlorine Dewi LLM. But before we start, please allow me to introduce Mrs. or Ibu Chlorine Dewi LLM. Ladies and gentlemen, she is a researcher and she started her career as a lecturer since 2005 at the Faculty of Law, Universitas Pejaran, in the subject of human rights law, international law, humanitarian law, and international criminal law. Ibu Chlorine was a consultant for several government institutions and as an academician, she has published several articles and also journals in the area of international law. And she is now involved in some researchers at the Indonesian Center for the Law of the Sea. And she is also coaching the ICRC Humanitarian Law and ICC Mood Court Competition. And now I would like to hand over the session to Ibu Chlorine Dewi LLM. Ibu Chlorine, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Renata, for the wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, before I, we start the session with a, a lecture uh, from Prof. Tomiko, uh, let me introduce, uh, let me uh, say a quote from Professor Mohtar Kusumat Maja. Think not like a craftsman, the cobbler, a plumber, or a carpenter who work within the confines of existing international law, but as a master builder or architect with a mission to build a new and better world. Muhtar Kusumat Majah, 1972. That's a quote of uh, Professor Muhtar that uh, uh, trigger uh, that, that motivate us to, to talk about this issue. He, as introduced by Professor Atip Latiful Hayat, he insisted to have an archipelagic uh, state concept in the UNCLOS. And finally, it was uh, accepted as a part of the uh, uh, articles in the UNCLOS. And here we have Professor Tomiko, who is a live witness of uh, the making of this uh, United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea and how the struggle of Professor Mokhtar and also others. If I may say, Professor Tomiko was the, is the best friend of Professor Mohtar, uh, who also try, uh, fight for this issue. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the past of Professor Mohtar Kusuma Atmajo on June 6 uh, brought a 
deep uh, condolence and grief for all, all of us international law enthusiasts, particularly us, the students. Uh, Professor Mohtar is a prominent figure, a lawyer, a scholar, a diplomat, who not only gained recognitions nationally, but internationally. Uh, by virtue of his efforts to vocalizing the archipelagic state principle against the Western um, um, power, uh, today many countries in the world have been blessing with the established maritime, maritime territory. His achievement to advocate their, uh, the archipelagic state principle is clear evidence that knowledge could be useful for bringing benefits for humankind and creating peace for humanity. Uh, in an attempt to obtain more understanding and scrutinize the thoughts of Mr. Mohtar Kusumat Maja regarding the archipelagic state, the ILA Indonesian branch uh, organized uh, ILA Dialogue, a tribute, uh, tribute to Mohtar Kusumat Maja, sovereignty and the sea. How Indonesia become an archipelagic state? Uh, the dialogue, actually, the topic was inspired by the, the book written by John G. Butcher and R. E. Elson. Um, them, this book, the book demonstrates the struggling process of the Indonesian diplomats to elevate, um, to elevate Indonesian unilateral, unilateral policy known as the Juanda Declaration 1957 and seeking to gain international recognition. And after more than two decades uh, diplomatic campaign, uh, the struggle was not in vain since the archipelagic state principle reached international consensus and was adopted under 1982 on United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. And it is important to note that at the time when Indonesian diplomatic campaign was conducted, apart from getting opposition from Western maritime power, Indonesia was also confronted with many national problems. Since Indonesia delegation strives earnestly to craft and build a new regime on archipelagic states uh, with Mohrar as the central figure, all of this obstacle can be overcome. And today, after the archipelagic state principle is recognized internationally, states are enabled to make up uh, numerous islands and uh, other land features to bring the oceans and seas that connect the land territory under the national jurisdictions for exploitations of natural resources, for example, communications and security. And um, to uh, this dialogue uh, intended to uh, be and in introducing so the international law and the law of the sea, we also would like to provide a deep understanding on the archipelagic state principle through the historical and contemporary perspective uh, by scrutinizing the book Sovereignty and the Seas, how Indonesia became an archipelagic state. And, and therefore, we, we have three speakers, but uh, we have our main speakers, the keynote speakers, the, the really key persons who were who was involved in the making of the UNCLOS and how was the, uh, the, 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 the struggle of uh, this concept was finally adopted into uh, the UNCLOS. We have Professor Tomiko. Before Professor Tomiko uh, starts his lecture, I would like to give a brief introduction of um, his curriculum vitae. Uh, professor Tomiko is a Singapore uh, international lawyer, professor, pro diplomat, and author. He's the chairman of at the Center, Center for International Law, National University of Singapore. And he also an ambassador for, uh, at large at Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Special Advisor of the Institute of Policy Studies and Chairman of National Heritage Board. Uh, he has a lot of uh, responsibilities. <laughs> it's very, very productive. Uh, Professor uh, Tomiko graduated from Raffles Institutions and Suragan Secondary School and received LLB. Uh, first uh, class earner uh, from the University of Malaya in Singapore, or now and known as the National University of the Singapore. And he took LLM from the Harvard University and postgraduate diploma in criminology from Cambridge University. But now he's uh, <laughs> digging in the, in the sea, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no longer <laughs> playing in the criminology. And he also uh, got uh, LE degrees from Yale University and Monash University, and also awards a uh, receive award from Columbia University, Stanford University, Georgetown University, and Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and Curtin University. I think we, I shall. Um, I think stop then. No, too stop long. Then. So many. <laughs> stop, stop then. Stop <laughs> then. Cukup, cukup. Uh, we have a lot of lists of uh, the achievement of Professor Tomiko. Okay, my, uh, Professor Tomiko, without prolonging you, I would let the yeah. screen to yeah. be yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Selamat pagi, everybody. 
uh, Ibu Corinne, our capable moderator. Selamat pagi. Professor Pak Atip Latifu Hayat, the president of the Indonesian branch of the International Law Association and Professor of International Law at Pajajaran University. Dr. Lowell Bautista of the Wollongong University in Australia. Professor and Pak Guzman Kato Siswandi of Pajajaran University, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to thank you all very much for giving me the pleasure of delivering this lecture in memory of my good friend, Pak Mokta, who passed away on the 6th of June this year at the age of 92. I wish also to thank Pajajaran University and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia for having conferred on me the inaugural Pak Mokta Award for International Law in 2017. I have very happy memories of my visit to Bandung, and I was particularly happy that Pak Mokta was able to come from Bogor to join us at the ceremony. Pak Mokta was born on the 17th of February, 1929, in what was then Batavia in the Dutch East Indies. Pak Mokta was a nationalist and he had opposed the Dutch colonial rule of Indonesia. After Indonesia had gained its independence, Pak Mokta studied law at the University of Indonesia in a joint degree, in a double degree program. So he graduated from the University of Indonesia with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Yale Law School. He also obtained a PhD from Pajajaran University. Pak Mokta and I were very old friends. He was the Dean of the Law School at Pajajaran when I was the Dean of the Law School in the University of Singapore. We befriended each other and tried to promote cooperation between our two law schools. Pak Mokta was the Indonesian Minister for Justice from 1974 to 1978 and was the Foreign Minister for 10 years from 1978 to 1988. It was, he was an outstanding Justice Minister and brought about many reforms of the Indonesian legal system. He was equally successful as Foreign Minister. History will give him credit for helping to break the impasse over the Cambodian conflict. He managed to persuade Vietnam to attend what came to be known as the Jakarta Informal Meeting or GIM. And GIM paved the way for France to convene a peace conference in Paris in 1989 and 1991. Mokta should have been asked by France to be the co-chairman of the peace conference. Pak Mokta and I met again at the third conference on the law of the sea. He was the leader of the Indonesian delegation and I led the Singapore delegation. Pak Mokta's historic mission at the conference was to persuade the world to accept the new concept of an archipelagic state and to recognize Indonesia as an archipelagic state. See, Indonesia had not been successful in 1958 at the first and second UN conferences on the law of the sea. At the third conference, Pak Mokta had a three-pronged strategy. First, Indonesia would find common cause with other countries which also aspired to be recognized as an archipelagic state. Second, to try to negotiate an agreement with the then two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And third, 
to negotiate with Indonesia's two neighbors, Malaysia and Singapore, and to obtain their support. One of the unique features of the third conference in the Law of the Sea was the establishment of many interest groups, many, many interest groups. My colleague, Professor Jai Kumar, and I have written a very long chapter on the negotiating process of the conference in volume one of the University of Virginia commentary on Angkor. In our, in our chapter, we had a comprehensive listing of all the interest groups. One such group was the Archipelagic States Group. This group had four member countries, Fiji, Indonesia, Mauritius, and Philippines. Mauritius dropped out of the group in the later stages of the conference. And Bahamas, which was not a member of the group, but cooperated closely with the members of the group. The group tried to agree on a negotiating text which could be submitted to the conference. According to Satya Nandan of Fiji, in his, in his uh, book, which was published recently, but unfortunately posthumously, Reflections on the Making of the Modern Law of the Sea, is published by NUS Press. According to Satya Nandan, and I quote him at page 85, he said, the archipelagic states could not agree on a negotiating text because of the insistence of Indonesia and the Philippines to limit the passage rights of nuclear-powered submarine and nuclear weapon-carrying vessels to the sea lane. Fiji could not go along with their views. So there was no consensus in the archipelagic states group. And as a result, they were not able to submit uh, a, a common text to the conference. I'm not privy to the Indonesian record on the negotiations with the United States and the Soviet Union. According to Satya Nandan's book, um, Indonesia's talks with the United States did not result in an agreement. They couldn't agree. Now, let me now talk about Indonesia's negotiations with Malaysia and Singapore. Since the third conference made all of the decisions by consensus, Indonesia knew that if its proposal were opposed, by Malaysia or Singapore, or both, then its proposal will be rejected by the country. There will be no consensus. So it was critical for Pak Mokta to get the agreement of Malaysia and Singapore to support the proposal. In order to accommodate Malaysia, Pak Mokta accepted the text of Article 47, Paragraph 6, of the convention. What does this paragraph do? In essence, Indonesia accepted a high seas corridor between East Malaysia and West Malaysia. This was Malaysia demand in return for supporting Indonesia's proposal. This concession was also embodied later on in a bilateral treaty. Pak Mokta and I had several rounds of negotiation on Singapore's rights and interests. In 1976, Pak Mokta and I were successful in, uh, in accepting it, successful in formulating a, a text which we jointly submitted to the reporter of the second committee, Satya Nandan, who was tasked with drafting 
the single negotiating text on behalf of the committee. And there's a story behind it. You see, in 1976, two years after the conference started, we still didn't have a negotiating text. And we were going round in circles, you know? So in 1976, I proposed to the conference that we request the three chairmen of committees one, two, and three to draft a single negotiating text for our consideration. The conference accepted my proposal and the three chairmen, Paul Engel, committee one, Galinda Paul, committee two, uh, Alexander Yango, committee three, were given this mandate. Unfortunately, um, Ambassador Galinda Paul met with an accident. He walked into a, a glass door and was quite severely injured. As a result, he was hospitalized. And Ambassador Galindo Paul asked his reporter, this young reporter from Fiji, Satya Nanda, whether he could draft the single negotiating text. So, you know, this is a, a fate of history, you know. The text should have been drafted by the chairman, Galinda Paul, who unfortunately met with an accident, had to be hospitalized. And he then asked his reporter, Satya, whether he could do, do the job for him. So, so Satya did. So Satya accepted the text that Mokta and I presented to him. And this is now embodied in paragraph one of article 51. So if you look at article, article 51, paragraph one of UNCLOS, this text, was negotiated by Park Mokta and me and submitted jointly to Ambassador Satyananda. The relevant part of Article 51.1 read, and I read it to you, eh? without prejudice to Article 49, an archipelagic state shall respect existing agreements with other states and shall recognize traditional fishing rights and other legitimate activities of the immediately adjacent neighboring states in certain areas falling within archipelagic waters. The question is, what does the phrase other legitimate activities refer to? In my negotiation to Park Walker, He requested, he accepted my request to preserve the existing right of Singapore to conduct training activity, military training activity in waters which will in future be enclosed as part of Indonesia's archipelagic waters and territorial sea. This is an example of Park Mokta's fair mindedness and pragmatism. He was a fair-minded person and, and he felt since both in Malaysia and in Singapore have legitimate interests which had to be accommodated, he was willing to accommodate them, you know. And, and this is an example of his greatness. If there are any doubts on what Article 51, Paragraph 1 means, I want to refer you to Volume two of the commentary of the University of Virginia on Angkor. And I quote from page 453, quote, the other legitimate activities in article 51, paragraph one, include military users such as training, and they have been legitimately exercised before the archipelagic regime provided by the convention was established, unquote. In his, in his book, which I've referred to, uh, Satyanandan wrote this on pages 
118 and 119. I'll, I'll read those. I'll read the paragraph to you. Quote, Article 51.1 became known as the Singapore Clause because it was included to protect Singapore's traditional fishing rights in areas that overlap with Indonesia and to undertake military training in its archipelagic waters and in its airspace above. The inclusion of legitimate activities was intended to ease everybody's tension. Among other things, legitimate activities include military training, both in the sea, the air, and surrounding areas." Unquote. Let me now conclude. Indonesia owes Park Mokhtar an enormous debt of gratitude. Because of his skillful diplomacy, his fair-mindedness, his pragmatic approach, he was able to win the support of Malaysia and Singapore and the other members of the conference to support the new concept of the archipelagic state and to recognize Indonesia as an archipelagic state. I hope succeeding generations of Indonesian diplomats and international lawyers will honor his legacy. Indonesia also owes a debt of gratitude to Satya Nandan of Fiji. As I explained earlier, he was a person who drafted the single negotiating text in 1976. And he was he who unilaterally inserted into the single negotiating text the provisions relating to archipelagic state. Satya Nandan had earlier co chaired with the United Kingdom a negotiating group on streets used for international navigation. So he used the regime for transit passage through streets used for international navigation as a model for archipelagic sea lane passage. I commend to you his book, which I've already referred to, uh, because it contains so many important insights into the behind scene negotiation on so many difficult issues, which were fortunately resolved. And that was how we have the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tomiko. So we know how was the struggle and one actually one of the biggest challenges is how to negotiate with Singapore and Malaysia who are very close to us. <laughs> Professor, uh, before we move on, uh, we continue, I would like to greet Professor Eti uh, Agus uh, and Professor uh, Mika Komar. Uh, oh. Selamat pagi, Ibu. Um, Halo, Ibu. Ibu, Ibu Mika, selamat pagi. Selamat pagi, Ibu. How are you? Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for uh, coming to this event. Ibu Eti also. Ibu Professor Eti. Uh. Yeah, how are you, Ibu? Thank you. See Maybe... the mute, Ibu Eti. Yeah. Hello. Hello, good morning, Hello. Ibu. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Hello. Good morning, Professor Tomiko. How are you? Can you hear? Can, can yes. you hear my yeah. voice? Yes, I can see you and I can hear you. <laughs> you, you can. You cannot hear me. Uh, I can. I can hear you. It Thank is... you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Good morning. How are you? Very well. Very well. Very good. Long time no see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We proceed, right? Okay, Ibu Mike, would you like to say something? <coughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. 
thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you uh, again, professors. Um, it's very honor for me here, uh, very young students of yours, to have great professors here. Um, I would like probably take some notes uh, from your from your lecture that yeah that was that the difficult uh, that it's it's very challenging uh, to to put the concept of the archipelagic states into the unclosed. So uh, when first we said that it was a big struggle to uh, against the uh, 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 Western mil uh, maritime military uh, power, but then. Uh, as a matter of fact, another big challenge is to face our 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 own family, <laughs> which is Singapore and the Malaysia. However, uh, Professor uh, Mohtar uh, um, can uh, can cope with that, and then the articles of the Article Fifty One is also one of the result of the negotiations uh, result with the with the Singapore and Malaysia. So uh, all of the interests of the states yeah. are uh there <laughs> try yeah. to be completed but yes one of the issues is about the military activities which is quite quite sensitive yeah. issue until today i think professor tomiko yes i agree i agree yeah uh, we have some cases uh yeah our students wrote about research over their uh, dissertations like um uh some there, there are something unclear about what is the meaning of uh, uh, uh military activities what is the peaceful activities which one is not peaceful and uh, knowing that the, the advanced uh, technology uh, today is like, um, you know, taking the uh, uh, information from the cable, is, is, it a uh, is it lawful or not? And many are. Oh, yeah, are, you, now. Are, yes. you are you asking me a question? Uh, no, no, I mean, no. just like I'm giving oh, okay. some, uh, yeah, Comment. the current situations. Yeah. I mean, like, a, okay. the, the, it's still some issues I, I think yeah. about the military activities but uh, yeah but probably you can may, maybe you would like to respond about the situations yeah because the, the developments of the advanced technology make us also quite difficult to distinguish which one is uh, a lo uh, lawful and not and unlawful in regard to the military activities and training uh, maybe we should hear the two discussions first okay okay uh, then all right, I will uh, then we'll just uh, proceed to our discussions. We have Dr. Lowell Bautista and also Dr. Guzman. Uh, Dr. Lowell Bautista is a senior lecturer and the head of postgraduate students uh, from the School of Law, Faculty of Business and Law, University of Wollongong, Australia. Our dean also was the alumni of the University of Wollongong, yeah, but, it is, but I, I don't know whether he's here or not. And uh, uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Bautista uh, uh, has a, uh, expertise in, uh, in the uh, in law of the sea, particularly in the contributions of the area territorial and maritime disputes in the Asia Pacific, especially in South China Sea. He also established, uh, uh, has an established and solid track record of research and publications in regards to the uh, law of the sea with the government and academic institutions. Um, uh, he is a lawyer with over 10 years of experience in legal and policy research, litigations, and consultancy. Uh, he, uh, he had a Bachelor of Art in Political Science, also he is also a politician, <laughs> probably, but he also think like a real, uh, good uh, diplomat and also hold a Bachelor of Law from the University of the Philippines and Master of Law from the uh, Dolores uh, uh, University in Canada and Doctor of Philosophy from the um, um, in law uh, uh, from the University of Wollongong. I think um, uh, I will not read a lot, uh, all of the story of your <laughs> of your curriculum, Peter, uh, Dr. Bautista. I will just like uh, uh, proceed to the response of how actually the situations in the Philippines in responding uh, this uh, the concepts of this archipelagic uh, state. Probably you can tell us about the role of the Philippines in the creations of the archipelagic states principle and uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the archipelagic states principle for the Philippines. And also probably sharing the future visions of the Philippines as an archipelagic state to govern its marine, marine territory. And probably you can also be responding to uh, what the Professor Tomiko gave us on lectures about this, the, uh, this, the situations uh, on the past and the today. And, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Rotisa, please, the screen is yours. Terima kasih banyak, Florina. Dewi, please allow me a few uh, moments to share my screen. And uh, much grateful for that very 
generous introduction. Um, I think, uh, uh, can you, uh, can Kamitish, uh, let's, uh, okay, here you go. Okay, uh, selamat pagi and uh, uh, good morning. Uh, terima kasih banyak. I uh, hope you can see the screen I'm sharing. So before I begin, please allow me to uh, express my gratitude to the Indonesian branch of the International Law Association for the gracious invitation to speak at today's event. In particular, I extend my personal appreciation to Professor Atip Latipul Hayat, the president of the Indonesia, uh, International Law Association Indonesia branch, and uh, Dr. Dea Jeng Wulan Christianti or Christi, the secretary and treasurer of ILA Indonesia branch for their excellent organization of this uh, lecture series. I'm very truly honored and humbled to speak alongside Professor Tomiko and Professor Guzman Siswandi. I've been given the task to um, discuss archipelagic states from a Philippine perspective. It is very difficult uh, to uh, cover such a historically dense and logically uh, or conceptually or legally complex concept in uh, uh, you know, such a brief span of time, but I will certainly do my best. So I wish to preface uh, this presentation with a picture of a great man. So we have heard from Professor Tomiko, and I, I know that this uh, series uh, is actually uh, about Professor Mokhtar, but uh, on the screen is actually a picture of another great man. And I'm sure uh, Professor Tomiko would have been uh, aware and uh, hopefully he's also friends with uh, this great man on the screen. Yeah, I and, uh, and his name is uh, Arturo M. Tolentino. So uh, Arturo Tolentino or Arturo Modesto Tolentino was born in 1910 and he, was also, he, uh, he uh, unfortunately passed away in 2004 at the ripe old age of 93. And he was a Filipino politician. He was a diplomat and he served in the Philippine Senate uh, as a president and secretary <laughs> of foreign affairs. And he's also regarded as the father of Philippine archipelagic doctrine. And he is an expert on the law of the sea. So if Indonesia has uh, Professor Mokhtar, it is my submission that the, Philippine, uh, the Philippines has and his counterpart would be Senator Arturo Tolentino. It is impossible to discuss the Philippine archipelagic doctrine without mention and recognition of the great contribution that the country owes to Senator Tolentino. And by way of brief background, Arturo Tolentino was a man of humble beginnings. As a student, Tolentino was noted for his scholarship. He was also an outstanding orator, a debater. He was a lawyer by profession, a law professor, and a recognized legal luminary. Tolentino had a long and distinguished and illustrious career in um, government service. He was a lawmaker and during his time in Philippine Congress, he was often involved in great intellectual battles and he was feared for his parliamentary prowess. I could go on and on about his many achievements, but for purposes today, for our purposes today, suffice it to say that Senator uh, Arturo Tolentino was the head of the Philippine delegation to the UN conferences on the law of the sea. So the Philippine archipelagic concept was first formally embodied in the Philippine position paper of March 7, 1955, which declared that all the waters around between and connecting the different islands of the archipelago belonging to, um, belong to the Philippine archipelago, irrespective of their width or dimensions, are necessary appurtenances of its land and territory forming an integral part of the national or inland waters subject to the exclusive sovereignty of the Philippines. So if you look at this definition, there, there are some analogs or similar words to the convention itself, as Professor Tomiko uh, read to us. They were also quite uh, uh, um, ahead of their time because they, they, they were really the formulation of this uh, concept, a legal fiction that uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, Fiji, and other similar-minded states uh, advocated and uh, strongly lobbied for during the conferences. So the principle that you see on the screen is uh, also uh, later enshrined and also uh, articulated in diplomatic correspondences. 
And in fact, it is also enshrined in the Philippine constitutions of 19, um, 30, 1973 and 1987, particularly in Article 1, which defines the Philippine national territory. We'll go to this uh, in, in a short while. So in the words of Senator Tolentino in, uh, the, in 1958, um, in the convention and the conference on the law of the sea, he said that to apply the three mile rule to the Philippines with every island having its own territorial sea would have the fatal effect upon the territorial integrity of the Philippines. It would mean the dismemberment of the Philippine archipelago with the Cebuian Sea separating the Visayas and Mindanao and Sulu Sea isolating Palawan from the rest of the archipelago. This and other waters would cease to be Philippine waters. They would become international waters or high seas. So you can see this very nationalistic flavor in the, in the, in the formulation of their statements. So they were view, viewing the Philippine archipelago. Um, and of course, there were developments alongside this in, the, in, in Indonesia happening. An embodiment of an, an, an articulation of a unity of land, water, and people. And the, the converse argument that if you do not allow this uh, special regime, then the archipelago, as they have uh, conceptualized it, would be dismembered. So it is clear that the, the, if you read the accounts of uh, those, of course, I don't have the, the, the luxury and good fortune of being there uh, in person during the negotiations, but I've also read the, as, a, as an account, the, those who have been um, involved personally, it is most critical, it, it, it is clear if you read the accounts, of those who uh, were members of the Philippine delegation, that the, Philipp that the most critical aspect of the UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, and in fact, the convention to them, which impelled them to actively participate in the UN Conferences on the Law of the Sea, uh, was the issue of archipelagic doctrine. The Philippines, just like any other country which participated in UNCLOS, had submitted many proposals. They advocated and lobbied for the inclusion of this proposal in the text of the convention. However, as uh, Senator Tolentino explained during the signing of, of UNCLOS, the, de the determining factor, and I'm quoting him, the determining factor in arriving at this decision was the sovereignty of the archipelagic state over archipelagic waters. So the, the Philippine delegation saw and seized this once in a lifetime opportunity. And you can already imagine as, as uh, very colorfully depicted to us by, uh, by uh, Professor Tomiko, how difficult it was for this tiny mid-ocean archipelagos in the Pacific to go you know, uh, head to head with the major maritime powers at this time. So they were looking at the national, the national security. They were um, uh, willing to make sacrifices, but not to give up the concept of the archipelagic uh, uh, doctrine, which they thought was an opportune time, a time which may not, ha might not come again. And uh, they did, uh, you know, take advantage of this opportunity and they seize the moment. Uh, it is safe to say that the, that the Philippine delegation to UNCLOS, UNCLOS was actually obsessed with the archipelagic doctrine. The only living member of the Philippine delegation to UNCLOS, hopefully uh, Professor Tomiko has fond memories as well, is former Solicitor General Estelito Mendoza. And in 2015, in a lecture at the University of the Philippines, he stated that the archipelagic principle has, with all due respect to Indonesia, has Philippine nationality. And in, in his words, in our case, uh, we were focused on the archipelagic principle. We didn't get involved too much on the others. We were just watching out as to whether any of the articles were going to prejudice our position. So they, were, they, they came there with a purpose. They had a clear mandate. They knew what they were asking. They, they also were aware of uh, the great difficulties of securing that. But you know, their, 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 their efforts, their sacrifices, and definitely their skill, their skill definitely paid off. So in December 10, 1982, in Montego Bay, Jamaica, the Philippines signed the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. And in May 8, 1984, the Philippines became the 11th state party to ratify UNCLOS, which entered into force in March, November 16, 1994. So please allow me to expound uh, the archipelagic principle. So in March 14, 1974, Fiji, Indonesia, Mauritius, and the Philippines submitted to the Seabed Committee their basic principles of archipelagic states. And on behalf of these states, Minister Arturo Tolentino of the Philippine delegation tendered the basic principles which read, uh, there are just three. So an archipelagic state 
whose compo component islands and other natural features form an intrinsic geographical, economic and political entity and historically have or may have been regarded as such, may draw baselines connecting the outermost points of the outermost islands and drying reefs of the archipelago from which the extent of the territorial sea of the state is or may be determined. Secondly, the waters within the baselines, regardless of their depth or distance from the coast, the seabed and the subsoil thereof and their super adjacent airspace, as well as the other resources belong and are subject to the sovereignty and of the archipelagic state. And finally, innocent passage, this should remind you of uh, Chlorine uh, Dewey's points about the contentious uh, uh, disputes about navigational regimes and, um, and uh, the, the interests of the maritime states. A very, very uh, distinctive flavor in the negotiation. Innocent passage of foreign vessels through the, the waters of archaeologic states shall be allowed in accordance with this national legislation, having regard to the existing rules of international law, which I think they were challenging at this time. Such passage shall be through sea lanes as may be designated for purposes of by the archaeologic state. So if you if you superimpose this in what is happening uh, in other in, in other parts of the world, it is about the same time that Indonesia has also taken prior unilateral position in the Indonesian Declaration of December 13, 1957, mentioned to us by uh, Professor Atipini's introductory lecture, otherwise known as the Juanda Declaration, which embodied Wawasa Nusantara or the Indonesian archipelagic vision. I'm, I'm sure Professor uh, uh, Guzman will discuss this later on. So the Republic of Indonesia is also espousing that the archipelagic, archipelago of Indonesia be treated as one unit, the same formulation, where all the waters surrounding, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago, regardless of breadth, are to be considered as internal waters. So you can see there is some uh, inconsistency with the with the words of the convention later on, but you can certainly see the 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 way it was um, articulated and the the um, the the clarity in the in the in the in the terminologies that they used. So the, the, the issue and problem of archipelagos have, have been a long-standing issue in international law. It's not something new. In, in fact, prior to the declarations of the Philippines and Indonesia, there have already been attempts in the international realm to settle the unique situation of the archipelagos. For example, in um, as early as 1888, in its Lausanne session and in 1928 in its Stockholm conference, the Institute de Droit International tried to draw up certain rules in the delimitation of the waters of archipelagos. But these meetings hardly adopted any definite resolution of the regime of territorial waters of archipelagos. In 1926, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing a very quick uh, historical uh, overview here of where, where uh, the, the law was at that time and uh, the, the going against the grain that uh, Indonesia and the Philippines had to go in the, in the conferences. In 1926, the International Law Association in its 39th conference in Vienna also discussed the same question, but there was no definite stand taken. A few years later in 1929, the draft convention on the territorial waters at, of the Harvard Research and International Law discussed the matter, but also no provision contained any reference to the archip to archipelagos. A year later in 1930, the Hague Conference for the Codification of International Law likewise failed to reach a consensus and in fact, it did abandon the idea of drafting a definite text. So if you, if you uh, move forward, no agreement. We know from uh, Professor Tomiko's explanation that no, no agreement uh, was reached uh, in respect of archipelagos in the first conference on the law of the sea. And again, it was discussed in the, in the second United Nations conference on the law of the sea, which met in Geneva in March 17 to April 27, 1916. But similar to the 1958 conference, the 1916 International Conference likewise failed to resolve or adopt the archipelagic doctrine as espoused by the archipelagic states, particularly Indonesia and the Philippines. Of course, we all know now that at UNCLOS 3, the UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, the Philippines and other advocates of the archipelagic doctrine or principle, specifically Indonesia, Fiji, P Papua New Guinea, Mauritius, succeeded in codification of the archipelagic doctrine, which we found find in art, um, part four of the convention. So as I'm principally tasked to look at the archipelagic doctrine from the Philippine perspective, please allow me to 
give a big, brief background of uh, the Philippines. So the Philippines, as we know, is an archipelago of uh, 7,100 islands. It's in the South China Sea. It occupies a land area of uh, 298,170 square kilometers. It has a very long coastline of 36,000 kilometers. How, how is the Philippine national territory defined in uh, domestic legislation? So historically, the Philippines traces its present title to the United States as the successor state to the territory ceded by Spain to the United States. Similar to, the, to Indonesia, the Philippines also has a very long colonial history. So the Philippines claims it, that it acquired its current territorial boundaries marked on the map on the screen uh, by what is called the Philippine Treaty Limits on the basis of three treaties. First is the Treaty of Paris between Spain and the United States of 10 December 1898. Secondly, the Treaty of Washington between the United States and Spain of 7 November 1900. And finally, the, finally, the treaty of uh, concluded between the United States and Great Britain on 2 January 1930. The Republic of the Philippines uh, argues that the, the, that the line described in accordance with the Philippine treaty limits, at least before, um, I'll go to this point a bit later on, the, the pre Philippine treaty limits constitutes the territorial limits of the Philippine archipelago. So I, as I mentioned earlier, the Philippine constitution specifically defines the extent of the national territory of the Philippines. Um, I think uh, you are muted, Lowell. Um, I don't uh, have I been, okay. Yeah. Should I continue? Yes, please. Okay. So, um, and also in the 1987 constitution. So it's constitutionally defined in domestic legislation. So for a long time at the domestic level, the constitutional definition of the Philippine national territory is actually the primary source of difficulty of aligning domestic legislation with the obligations of the Philippines under the Law of the Sea Convention. This constitutional definition is further reflected in domestic legislation. And in fact, the Philippines has enacted domestic legislation that provide for the various maritime jurisdictional zones such as uh, the Territorial Sea Contigo Zone, EZ, and the Continental Shelf. But these all predate the Law of the Sea Convention itself. So in the context of the, country, the country's domestic constraints, the massive task of aligning and harmonizing the domestic or municipal law of the Philippines proved to be easier said than done. So they went to the conferences, they argued for the Arc Project Doctrine, which they won and able to secure and codified in the convention. But on the domestic front within the Philippines and before a domestic audience, it took longer to align uh, and harmonize domestic legislation. And in fact, if you read the literature in the interim, you, you will find that the Philippines has been very heavily criticized for its um, purported you know, uh, position uh, not to uh, abide with the, the, the text and the spirit of the convention. So it actually took the country over two decades before I'm, I'm actually speeding up in, in, in terms of history and hopefully you're able to um, follow. So it took the country two decades before Republic Act number 9522, otherwise known as the Philippine Archipelagic Baseline Law was passed in March 2009. So RA 9522 is actually technically adjusted so that the baselines and the base points um, meet the requirements of articles 46 and 47 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. If, if you look at the old Philippine Baselines Law, RA 3046, which was enacted in 1961, again, as I mentioned, these are laws of vintage origin, which predate the convention. The, 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 the statute then defined the waters include, but includes by the baselines as internal waters. And as I said, these declarations were uh, uh, questioned by the international community. So going back to the new baselines law, the baselines law was indeed a paradigm shift for the Philippines. So it was uh, an abandonment of the old Philippine maritime architecture based on the definition, the historical rights that uh, were claimed under the Treaty of, Treaty of Paris. And it was a, a, a good step towards full harmonization of the relevant domestic legislation of the Philippines with international law, particularly the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Of course, there were uh, further measures that need to be taken there uh, over uh, the, the years that followed the, the 
um, the convention and the conference, and even after this, the ratification of the Philippines, there have been many pending laws, uh, bills uh, in, the, in the Philippine Congress, both in the lower house and the Senate, that uh, sought to establish Philippine maritime, law, Philippine maritime zones. I'm aware at the moment that there are pending laws, uh, bills in, in Congress uh, along these lines, as well as proposals to enact a law establishing archipelagic sea lanes in archipelagic uh, waters. So there, it is uh, quite clear that there are policy imperatives for the Philippines to claim archipelagic state status. It's a national, there are national security imperatives, there are policy imperatives. If you look at the geological and, and uh, geostrategic considerations, uh, uh, there are also these reasons which underpin the Philippines to adopt UNCLOS and declare itself an archipelagic state. The Philippines, if you look at the Philippines, is a, it's a quint quintessential coastal state. It is not, there is no single town. Perhaps I can, you can say the same for Indonesia. There's no single town or city in the Philippines that is not more, that is more, that is well, more than a hundred kilometers from the shore. It has a coastline that is, uh, as I said, very extensive. 62 out, out of the 71 um, <coughs> provinces are coastal. The Philippines is clearly an archipelagic state and an archipelago. So it's constituted as, as an archipelago. It's 7,100 islands are compact. They're closely interrelated. They constitute an intrinsic geographical entity. If you look at the, the map on the screen, the Philippines has very important critical straits for international navigation. So there's the Babuyan Channel, the Balintang Channel, the Luzon Straits in the north, the San Bernardino in Mindoro Straits in the midsection of the archipelago, the Surigao in Balabac Straits in the south, and all of this interconnect points towards the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Straits of Malacca in Singapore, and further on to, in the, in, to the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. The Philippines is also a hotbed of geologic, geologic resources and activity. And in terms of biodiversity, marine biodiversity, the Philippines is characterized as the center of the center of marine biodiversity. I'm down to my last two slides. So I... I Normally, uh, you know, I could spend uh, hours and hours, even days, to uh, give you a lecture on the on the law of the sea, particularly on the archipelagic regime. We we now know that the the, the juridical and legal definition of uh, the archipelago is in the in the convention itself. But I just want to flag this uh, this slide because uh, you know I, I want to uh, uh, challenge and and and, and uh, give you food for thought. Because the archipelago is a is is a is a word which is rich rich in Asian resonance, it also ca carries a lot of weight uh, in terms of history and discourse. And of course, we can hear accounts of the convention itself from uh, those who negotiated the convention. But we should also look at uh, other scholarship. There is scholarship, particularly third world approaches of viewing international law, that suggests that the term archipelago is not innocent. Archipelago, as you know, it's a political, you know, it's a legal fiction, and it's uh, projected differently over historical epochs. It, it uh, combines ideas of island, continent, empire, and nation. There are some studies which suggest that there's a violent aspect of how archipelagos are constituted. And today, I, I, uh, as, I, um, as we revisit the contribution of Professor Mokhtar and also recognize the efforts of those who negotiated the convention, it's important to recognize these other voices and perspectives. Archipelago or archipelagic state is also a collective identity. It also encompasses in a sociological sense, a shared sense of diaspora and history, settlement, mobility, and change. And in my view, it is intrinsically linked to notions of national identity and nation building. I have no time to discuss this, unfortunately, but I'm flagging them merely as food for thought after all, even, uh, even um, speaking as a lawyer, not the legal perspective is not the only perspective. So there are ontologies, epistemologies, theoretical, metaphorical, real and empirical powers uh, that, that we need to consider when we look at the archipelago and the archipelagic state concept and the doctrine itself. This is my final slide and thank you for your patience. Uh, I just have a few final thoughts. So again, it is, it is, uh, it is, uh, it cannot be denied that the archipelagic state doctrine and regime is a significant victory. It is not a mean feat. As I said, you can imagine the great debates, the great oratorical skills that the, the Philippines, Indonesia, 
would have to have mast mastered to win the the debates on the floor. And I can I can only imagine because I, as I said, I don't have the good fortune to have been part of that. I wish I could, right? But today we celebrate and as we should and memorialize and hopefully we can inculcate uh, amongst our people this massive victory. And I want to emphasize the word victory there. So we should remember uh, the sacrifices and the hard work of uh, those who, who made this possible. Mokhtar, Senator Tolentino, which I've discussed. And of course, Professor Tomiko, I mean, who, whose invaluable role is a running thread in, in, in all of this. So, the, but yet, Challenges remain, and uh, there is still unfinished business which needs to be addressed. Looking at the Philippines, of course, we don't have ASL yet. We uh, don't have uh, the maritime zones law. And I, I hate to mention at the in my final slide, territorial disputes, which uh, I've intentionally avoided to mention. So thank you so much for your time, your patience. And again, I express my sincerest gratitude, appreciation, and uh, I'm humbled uh, to have been given this opportunity to share my thoughts with you today. I invite you to... Um, uh, write your comments and questions, and I'll, 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 I'll be more than happy to address them later on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bautista. Wow, I think it's very impressive and comprehensive, particularly when you say about the history and everything there. Oh, I'm sorry here. <laughs> I think your son wants to say something. I'm sorry, that's my, that's my son. <laughs> sorry. It's all this happened. Uh, hang on for a second. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> it's a motherhood, uh, uh, another side of the working from home. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, back to, to I, I would like to try to resume the uh, Dr. Bautista's uh, presentations first. And now we know that there's Ar um, Arturo Talentino, who also have a similar figure like uh, Professor Mohtar Kusumat Majel for, for the Indonesians and a lot of work that has been done for the concepts of the uh, archipelagic concept. And I, the interesting thing from the Philippines is um, the struggle is not only, uh, uh, it's actually inside, in, internally in, in, the, in, in the Philippines itself between the uh, uh, senators and how to accept this concept. And um, I also would like to, to highlight that uh, what you uh, highlight that uh, it's uh, in, 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 in responding to the concept of the archipelagic state or implementing this concept, it's not only legal perspective that is uh, needed, but there are a lot of things, other things that need to be considered. And this should be, uh, uh, we should be very proud of this uh, because this is our victory from the development countries and the archipelagic countries who try to fight for our rights. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bautista. We'll let the audience keep the questions for you. Uh, before that, I will let pa Guzman to give our uh, his presentations about what is actually the Indonesian situations, uh, the perspective of Indonesia. Yes, Prof. Tommy. Uh, I, I want to apologize to pa Guzman. I have another meeting, so I'll be, I'll be leaving you at uh, 9.30, so I may not be able to hear all of his remarks. So, Pagusman, forgive me for not being able to hear all of your statement. Thank you. That's oh, all right, oh, Professor Tomiko. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, maybe it, can we, just, uh, uh, can we uh, proceed to Pagusman, or is there, would you like to uh, um, entertain for some questions or comments, Prof. Tommy, before you leave? Uh, I'm, I'm in your hands. I'm in your hands. You are the oh, boss. Okay. What then you decide? <laughs> okay then. Uh, yes, but I maybe... think it would be better if uh, maybe we can um, allow participants to um, perhaps ask some questions to Professor Tomiko. Okay. Happy okay. to do that. Yeah. Uh, is uh, before uh, Professor Tomiko leave? Is there any uh, participant who would like to ask questions or comments? Oh, I have such questions to Professor Tomiko. Yes, please, Pati. Yeah. Uh, Professor Tomiko, I, I'm interested to your uh, explanation about uh, the history of uh, <laughs> Article 51 in the UNCLOS, yeah. how the negotiating between the three countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, Singapore. Uh, my a concern is on uh, the meaning of the other legitimate activities, yeah. which includes the military training uh, yeah. activities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I heard from uh, Professor Hasim Jalal that uh, the term, the phrase other legitimate activities does not include uh, military activities. It is only for, for uh, fishing, uh, traditional fishing uh, activities. <laughs> and when uh, currently there is a negotiations between Indonesia <laughs> and uh, Singapore on the realignments of flight information regions. And so one of the issue in this negotiation is uh, the, the, the inserting uh, Article 51 into uh, the, the, the issue of the alignments of that uh, flight information mm -hmm. regions. What do you think about that? Does, does this include the military uh, activities or just only <laughs> for uh, traditional fishing activities? Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Yeah, thank you, Pa Atip, for your question. Uh, pa Hashim Jalal and I are also very, very old friends. And, and I love him, and I love him. Um, but his argument can hold no water because if you look at the text of paragraph one, article 51, the text refers to traditional fishing rights. So traditional fishing rights already referred to in paragraph one, article 51. So obviously, obviously, other legitimate activity must, re must mean something else than fishing rights, right? In fact, Pak Mokta was so generous with me. He wanted to make this clear in a bilateral treaty, you know, in the same way as he had a bilateral treaty with Malaysia. He said, look, in future generations, they may not know what the term means, and your memories fade. He was prepared to negotiate a bilateral treaty with Singapore to clarify what this phrase means. I think I made a mistake in saying, but no need, you know, that, that we, we both know what it means and that uh, we, we make sure that our younger colleagues understand the history of the negotiations of Article 51, Paragraph 1. I, I think may, maybe I made a mistake. Thank you, Professor Tommy. <clears throat> Professor Tommy, um, uh, I also there's also questions from Dita Liliansa. I would uh, uh, yes. Dita, uh, Miss Dita, would you like to address the question directly? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, yeah. Franco. Uh, I'm hi. Dita from CIL. So yeah. thank you very much for the very uh, insightful lecture. Uh, I have uh, a question. Congratulations for winning a prize recently. Thank you, thank you, Franco. <laughs> We're very proud of you. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, you're very kind. Uh, I just have a follow-up question from Professor Atip. So uh, it's on Article 51 because I think it's a uh, it's an interesting that uh, you know you made a comment and on you know the negotiation process behind this article. But I was wondering because during that period, Indonesia was still uh, under the new order regime. You know, as we all know, you know during that time, uh, military took over uh, many high-ranking positions at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. Uh, so uh, because uh, Prof. Atif uh, raised a very uh, important uh, you know, question whether legitimate activities include uh, military activities. So I was wondering whether there are you know, any relations between uh, the two, you know, whether uh, you know, to, to your knowledge, you know, to what extent was Indonesia's military involved in the negotiation of Article 51? And do you think it influenced, you know, the intentional exclusion of the term military activities in Article 51? I think uh, that's uh, all my question. Thank you. TNI, as it used to be, no, had no role in the negotiation. The negotiation was directly and personally between Park Mokta and me. I made it clear to him that in Singapore would oppose the archipelagic concept unless our interests are accommodated. And what are our interests? There are two interests, traditional fishing rights and the right of our armed forces to continue to train in areas of the high sea, which will henceforth be enclosed in Indonesia's archipelagic waters and territorial sea. He understood that for a small country like Singapore, this is survival, you know? I mean, it's existential. This right is existential. So I, I told Pak Mokta very frankly, if you can't come accommodate these two interests, 
then we have no choice but to oppose the proposal. Yeah. And as I say, he's a very fine, fair minded guy, you know. He not only accommodated, but he said, I'm willing to conclude a bilateral treaty with you to, to make sure future generations understand that other legitimate activity mean military training activity. Okay. Uh, Professor, I think I, we have one more question. Uh, yeah, sure. Gary, Gary, please. Thank you very much, Bu Orin, for the opportunity. Good morning, Professor Ko. Yeah, good um, morning. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, my question is also uh, about Article 51, Professor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, since <laughs> this is a very uh, burning <laughs> issue right now. Yeah. Uh, Professor, um, as you say that um, other legitimate ex uh, uh, activities is included, uh, includes uh, military training activities, but if we look at um, a further text of Article 51, Paragraph 1, we can see that uh, the conduct of such um, other legitimate activity uh, must be negotiated and must be uh, regulated under bilateral agreement. Now, Indonesia and Singapore has had an, an, a defense cooperation agreement that ends in 2003 and renewed in 2007. Um, Indonesia and Singapore ha has um, signed the agreement, but the, uh, the parliament, Indonesian parliament, refused to ratify it. Now, uh, it seems that w Indonesia and Singapore are into a spiraling condition. So uh, this, this is means that uh, Singapore now cannot conduct uh, military activities in Indonesia on archipelagic waters. So my question is how we should, uh, how we should interpret Article 51, Paragraph 1, to avoid such a prolonged and a never ending negotiation between states, uh, neighboring state and archipelagic state. Thank you, Professor, for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you for a good question. Very good question. Um, I mean, there are many ways of interpreting uh, text, right? So I'm not saying that you must agree with my interpretation, but I, I tell you my understanding of para one, article 51, which is, our right, Singapore's right, to conduct military training activity is not contingent on the subsequent agreement, you know. It is, it, it is a right and it is not contingent on whether or not we can, can conclude the bilateral agreement on how to exercise those rights. That's how I understood it, yeah. I, I, did, I did ask Mark Mokta in our you know, consultation. Why not use specifically the word military training activity? You know, he said it's too provocative. You know? <laughs> too provocative. He said, he said can, we, can we think of some other language and then we, we, we have a common understanding on what it means, you know? So we came up with the idea of other legitimate activities. So I said, you know, the two of us understand what this means and maybe our two delegations do, but subsequently people may not understand, you know, that, but, uh, so it was, it was important that other people should understand. That, that's why I referred to the University of Virginia's commentary on, the, on UNCLOS, you know, which is a, a very authoritative commentary on UNCLOS. And this is also why I referred to the book by Satya London, because Satya was the guy who drafted the provisions of archipelagic states, you know. And Pak Mokta and I jointly handed him the paper containing the text of paragraph one of Article 51. In fact, he still had that paper. And when he, he gave a talk in Singapore, I think Sa pa, pa Hashim Jala were there. He produced a copy of the paper and said, this is the paper that Pak Mokta and Tommy gave him containing the text of paragraph one, Article 51. I'm afraid with the passage of time, you know, many people would have forgotten the history of the negotiations and what, what the meaning of the text are. You know? So it's important for us to, to have a common understanding of the negotiating process, the negotiating history uh, of both Article 47 for Malaysia, Article 51 for Singapore. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, I think, uh, yes, that's the, the issue today. Okay. Yes. So, 
<laughs> so Ibu, Clorin, please forgive me yeah. because I've got another meeting to go to. And I'd like yes. to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pa'atip, for inviting me. And uh, congratulations to Dr. Lowell for a very eloquent. Filipinos are so eloquent, no? <laughs> for a very <laughs> eloquent presentation. I, I was a friend of uh, Senator Tolentino. So I know that he's as important to the Philippines as Pa'amokta is to the Indonesian. No? In, the ASEAN delegation. Thank you very much. Terima kasih, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Tommy, before you leave, um, sorry, we would like to give you a, a certificates of appreciation from okay. for us. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, committee, would you like to take some photo with us? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, oh. Professor. Tommy. <laughs> okay. So this is our uh, Atip. Would you like to say something with me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much again. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's Thank very, you. Yeah, it's very Thank valuable. Um, and I'll, very I'll, I'll, send, I'll send a text on my remark to Ibu Christy. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank Selamat you very tinggal. much. Selamat tinggal. Selamat tinggal. Yeah. Selamat pagi. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because uh, Professor Tomiko has another uh, meeting to attend and uh, unfortunately she cannot be with us until the end of uh, this uh, meeting. But uh, don't worry, be happy. We still have Pak Guzman and Dr. Bosisa will be available through the, through the time uh, to have a discussion. And I will continue to Pak Guzman. Pak Guzman will deliver the sessions about the Indonesian perspective and I will let you uh, introduce him, uh, a brief introduction of him. Um, uh, Pak Guzman is a vice dean for academic affairs uh, in Faculty of Law, and he graduated from the Faculty of Law in Universitas Pajajaran in 98, and 1998, and uh, obtained Master of Law from the University College London in 2005 uh, as a Chevening Scholar, and finally got his doctoral degree from the Australian National University in 2014. Pa Guzman uh, specializes himself in, in uh, law of the sea, in particular regarding the bio, uh, um, uh, natural resources as well. Uh, so many research that he's been conducted in regard to these issues, and he also an expert and also member of the uh, internet. Uh, um, sorry, a compliance committee of the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing, and uh, currently. Uh, uh, the member of the Compliance Committee of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, representing Indonesia for the Asia Pacific countries. He's the man of uh, probably the next um, Tarkosom Atmaja from our faculty. Pagusman, <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh, sorry, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Bu Corin, for very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, uh, greetings, uh, selamat pagi, uh, mabuhai, uh, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here, a, a great privilege to be in the same forum with uh, Professor Tomiko and also Professor Lowell Bautista. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, uh, ILA Indonesian branch for inviting me and I wish also to uh, acknowledge uh, my uh, dear colleagues at the Department of International Law, Professor Atip, and also uh, all my uh, dear colleagues. Uh, we have also Professor Mika and Professor Ate Agus um, and it's an honor also to have uh, the presence of uh, colleagues from other universities um, uh, and it's great also to meet also Adita uh, here in this forum. Uh, Good to see you again, and also all the uh, lecturers, uh, students, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I would like to uh, share my uh, thoughts perhaps on uh, the topic that has been assigned, which is to uh, how can Indonesia uh, strengthen our maritime diplomacy as the largest archipelagic state? Um, it's a big uh, issue, it's a big topic. So um, I hope that I could uh, capture the essence in about um, 10 minutes. I will do my best. Uh, so 
I will start with uh, some introduction, um, uh, perhaps to uh, introduce the uh, a little bit of the context of my talk. And um, I would like to focus on the uh, challenges and opportunities in um, three perhaps um, uh, challenging issues that we currently have right now um, is regarding the uh, maritime boundary delimitation. Of course, as the uh, um, largest archipelago state, we have uh, so much uh, homework to do with uh, our delimitation and uh, the uh, notion of maritime security, as well as the uh, growing issues of the uh, marine environment. So um, as an introduction, I, uh, I reckon that um, the discussion, our discussion today is also based on, um, in addition to the books that the uh, Professor Tomiko ha has mentioned earlier, uh, this book is also um, uh, quite essential. It's from uh, Bachelor and Elson, uh, Sovereignty and the Sea, How Indonesia Became an Archipelago State. So um, I'm not going to uh, talk into the um, uh, legal details uh, actually, um, because all have been uh, presented by the uh, previous speakers, but I'm more interested uh, in the, um, how to call it, perhaps the, the, the human side of, of, of the, uh, the birth of the archipelagic state. So uh, uh, on page uh, 66, for instance, there is an interesting uh, conversation between uh, Professor Mohtar and Khairul Saleh. At that time, uh, he was the Minister for uh, Veteran Affairs. So uh, Khairul Saleh was uh, the one who actually challenged uh, Prof Mohtar to come up with this uh, idea of archipelagic state because he was uh, very concerned with the presence of uh, foreign um, especially military uh, foreign activities uh, within the Indonesian waters. So it, it was interesting that um, Professor Mohtar um, uh, firstly would say um, it cannot be done. <laughs> So, uh, and uh, I think it's again the, the fate of history that um, uh, that finally uh, Professor Mokhtar had the courage to come up with the uh, concept of uh, archipelagic state. And he also mentioned that um, it is contrary to international law, you, you know, if, if you want to draw this um, line connecting the outermost points of um, of the archipelago and you want to, uh, if you want to rest restrict um, other states from um, navigating through your waters, that would be contrary to international law. And interestingly, uh, next, uh, Hairu Saleh said, well, um, if, if we had listened to people like you, <laughs> too legal minded, then we would not uh, had um, our proclamation in the, in the first place. So you must change your way of thinking. So I think what I see um, in under the part four of the archipelagic state is is like um, legal creativity, if if I if, if I may. Um, the the main articles have been discussed, especially the article uh, fifty one, paragraph one. We have uh, discussed about this uh, extensively. But what I can um, observe and what I can reflect from part four is there there are not many articles there, but but it is. It shows. It reflects this kind of um, again legal creativity where you have uh, the quid pro quo. You you have to accommodate other states' interests, and you have to come up with a, such um, language that can be accepted by um, any state. Um, it is not a, a, a perfect part. It is not a perfect chapter. But uh, I think the struggle for Indonesia and also other uh, archipelagic uh, countries, including uh, especially Philippines, uh, were so, so successful, so successful because of this kind of creativity. You, you can um, still have, uh, you, can, you can still put your interests uh, as an archipelagic state at the table, but at the same time, you can also accommodate uh, other states' interests. And, um, there is a huge, uh, I think, uh, challenge that was faced by our negotiators uh, at that time, I can imagine. And I think the discussion uh, about the nature of the negotiation during the Law of the Sea Conference is not only um, discussed under the um, preferences or um, books on the Law of the Sea, but also books on the international dispute settlement and negotiation techniques because it was so monumental that uh, the uh, negotiation techniques during the law of this convention, including uh, part four, is uh, actually a, quite a phenomenon. Uh, so 
what I would like to perhaps um, uh, bring forward in, in put forward in the um, uh, this morning's discussion is that there's been this kind of uh, shift of um, underlying principle um, for archipelagic state regime. If we compare between what uh, happened um, when the Law of the Sea Convention was concluded and entered into force uh, in 1994. So now it, it is almost uh, 27 years after the uh, convention uh, entered into force. But if we can see uh, the uh, part four of, of the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, basically the articles they reflect the, uh, I would call it perhaps the uh, such a conventional uh, notion of sovereignty. You want to claim uh, your interests um, as a sovereign state. Uh, you want to claim your right to um, manage or to utilize your re resources within your archipelagic uh, waters. You want to claim your uh, maritime territory and you want to accommodate also navigational rights. But now at present, I think we ha also have to um, bring this up um, to um, face the challenges that not only we have to perhaps um, maintain our, our uh, sovereignty and uh, peaceful claims in our waters, but we also have to face this uh, consequences as especially as uh, Indonesia as the largest archipelagic state. We have uh, such a growing issue of uh, maritime security, uh, more pressing issue of uh, maritime mar marine environment, and also uh, the challenges of uh, sustainable development. So um, in that sense, uh, I would like to uh, continue to uh, my uh, uh, next section on the challenges uh, and opportunities. So I think the one of the obvious uh, challenges that we have to face, of course, to uh, finalize our uh, maritime boundary delimitation with uh, our neighboring countries. And uh, the homework is uh, so huge here. We have uh, 10 countries uh, we need to uh, negotiate with. And uh, most of them, well, are actually uh, have already um, established um, treaties or uh, settlement uh, with respect to uh, maritime boundaries, uh, except with the uh, Palau and uh, Timor Leste, which uh, is currently still ongoing. But uh, most of the uh, neighboring countries, um, we have already had settled um, uh, the um, maritime boundary agreements um, with respect to uh, either its territorial sea, continental shelf, or uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, not all of the maritime zones have been concluded. Uh, for instance, with the Philippines, we have been successful with the um, EEZ uh, boundary, but now we still have ongoing uh, negotiation with respect to a continental shelf. Now, the issue of uh, maritime security, I think is one of the uh, greatest challenges that we have to face in uh, Indonesia. And um, I think it's rather different from what we had uh, during the um, uh, 1982 uh, convention uh, negotiations, which at that time, uh, which I uh, alluded uh, to uh, your, your attention uh, earlier, at that time, Indonesia was very concerned about the uh, physical um, um, attack or physical intervention in, in, with respect to uh, defense and security by uh, foreign military activities. But now the uh, issue of maritime security has grown so much that it's not only about the, uh, um, with respect to the national security uh, physically, but also with respect to uh, marine environment, economic development, as well as human security. So I think one of the uh, uh, perhaps question that we can ask to ourselves, um, how can we respond to this kind of uh, development? While perhaps the uh, uh, articles under the, under part four of the Law of the Sea Conventions have provided answers when you have um, to accommodate the uh, uh, security interests in, in terms of your sovereignty. But what about the um, uh, other uh, issues which uh, is now a part of the uh, um, growing um, scope of um, uh, maritime security, security, which is not only the traditional security, but also non-traditional security. So here we have, um, Indonesia has established the archipelagic ceilings passage uh, from north to south and, and vice versa. Um, and if 
uh, I can uh, show you here uh, my um, perhaps uh, uh, from my readings uh, from the references with respect to security uh, along the uh, archipelagic Indonesia's archipelagic sea lanes. You 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 can see that we have so many different uh, concerns or different issues in each lane. Uh, for instance, in the uh, uh, most uh, western part, we uh, have issues ranging from the uh, South China Sea uh, situation um, in the north, and then we also have these um, uh, 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 repeating uh, occurrences of um, a natural disaster uh, in the southern part. And in the uh, uh, the second uh, archipelagic sea lane, in the middle one, we have this issue of um, uh, resources allocation, um, separatist movements, uh, maritime safety, and people smuggling. And while on the uh, eastern part, we have uh, to deal with issues uh, such as um, marine environment, IU fishing, and also separatist movements. So uh, I think this kind of um, reflecting the um, the growing issues of maritime security and um, Indonesia also is still struggling in how to respond uh, to this kind of challenge. Um, one of the challenges is the um, uh, institutions or agencies to deal with uh, this kind of issues. Um, we still have these um, various um, ministries and um, institutions involved in um, responding to uh, maritime security threats and um, in uh, 2014, uh, we have this Indonesia's uh, Oceans Act, uh, which says that, well, we will have this uh, Badan Keamanan Laut or Indonesia's Coast Guard to coordinate all the activities with respect to maritime safety and security. But now in practice, it's not um, as easy as, as it reads on, on, on the article. Uh, so much to navigate. Um, well, not only in the Indonesian waters, but also in the Indonesian's, uh, Indonesia's bureaucracy and um, institutional um, uh, spider web. So um, we have uh, the Navy, we have the Indonesia's Coast Guard, we also have the Ministry of uh, Transport, and we also have the uh, Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Affairs, who have been assigned also by the uh, legislation, by the law, to deal with um, issues that uh, is supposed to be coordinated by the Indonesia's Coast Guard. So this has uh, posed challenges and currently Indonesia is uh, still struggling with uh, this kind of um, designing the national fleet concept. So uh, according to the um, book by Bowers and Co, um, some countries are trying to um, establish this uh, central organizing principle, which well, it's okay to have uh, various agencies to deal with uh, maritime safety and security, but the most important thing that you have to have this kind of central organizing principle. And now it's still um, in the process. Um, uh, the Indonesia's Coast Guard or Bakamla uh, is trying to uh, come up with the initiative of uh, designing uh, um, the organization of uh, maritime uh, security agencies involved in uh, Indonesia. Uh, the second uh, challenge that is non-conventional, uh, other than um, delimiting boundaries, I think it's also the uh, impact of uh, sea level rise and climate change, for instance, on the baselines uh, and also on the, um, the marine environment of um, uh, archipelago state uh, in a whole. So the sea level rise here uh, would cause some impacts also to uh, on the uh, delimitation of baseline or also uh, the maritime boundary delimitation. And it is still also an ongoing, um, this, there's some ongoing discussions in Indonesia in how to respond to this challenge. Um, Jakarta has been, um, uh, here, uh, uh, here mentioned in some uh, news uh, as a fa the fastest sinking city in the world. Well, although uh, Jakarta is not, um, the, the coastline of Jakarta uh, is not bordering with uh, any uh, neighboring countries, but still it, it at least uh, shows uh, a, a kind of evidence that Indonesia have uh, to take more up, to pay more attention on how to deal with uh, this uh, sea level rise and climate change issue. Uh, for instance, in 2019, the IPCC issued this uh, special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a 
changing climate. And as you can see here, uh, the report suggested that uh, the coastal states, uh, especially those uh, who are vulnerable to uh, sea level rise and climate change, uh, can respond to this um, uh, measures, whether um, the advanced measure, protection measures, or retreat measures. Now, um, Indonesia, uh, as far uh, as I'm concerned, I have, we have talked about this uh, within uh, our um, academic uh, interactions, but um, so far, I, I don't think the, uh, we we have any uh, specific policy to uh, deal with kind of issue, especially um, the sea level rise and climate change that would have impacts on our baselines. And uh, the final uh, part of, of the challenge that I would like to discuss is that um, if we look at the, again, at the part four of the um, uh, Law of the Sea Convention, again, uh, we have uh, so much uh, articles that deal with the uh, uh, sovereignty claims, sovereign rights, and navigational rights. Now, the question is uh, now, when we have this kind of threats, um, marine environment and the growing issue beyond our uh, uh, jurisdiction, then how can we as the uh, largest archipelagic state also contribute to the uh, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity? So it's not only that we now have rights to um, manage our resources, but I think we also have the responsibility to ensure that we have some measures in place to conserve and sustainably use our marine environment and especially the marine resources and marine biodiversity. So it can also contribute to the uh, sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction. Now, uh, the instrument is still negotiated um, since the uh, um, the working groups uh, were established in 2005. Now uh, the negotiations is still ongoing and has been postponed due to the uh, pandemic. Uh, now the uh, instrument uh, is discussed through intersessional work and informal or online discussions. Um, this is these are the issues that uh, uh, are dealt with within the, the uh, proposed instruments. Uh, we have so many. Um, new or uh, contemporary issues to deal with, such as uh, marine genetic resources and benefit sharing, and how can we ensure also the uh, um, area-based management tools as well as environmental impact assessment. Now, uh, maybe there's a question. Uh, well, RCP, like you said, is so much a concept of uh, sovereignty and um, of, of, of a nation. Uh, and how can it be that this concept has something to do with something that is beyond national jurisdiction. Now, um, I have been uh, fortunate to uh, be involved in some discussions with my Indonesian colleagues. And um, I think I uh, completely agree with um, Dr. Lowell that uh, legal perspective is not only the only perspective that we have to take into account as a lawyer. But in the discussion of uh, BBNJ or biological diversity beyond national jurisdiction, I have a privilege to uh, get some insights and knowledge from my uh, scientist colleagues who um, uh, provided this kind of um, refreshing perspectives that, you know, what you do within your national waters can have impacts on whatever lies beyond national jurisdiction. So the idea of uh, ecological connectivity, I think here uh, teaches us that whatever we do within our waters, including archipelagic waters, will somehow also have impacts on the marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So currently Indonesia in um, preparing its uh, position, but we always um, try to advance our interests again as an archipelagic state, where in our waters we have this interaction between um, marine biodiversity that also we can find in um, beyond national jurisdiction. Um, the transboundary issues, uh, how we actually, like you said, should also take uh, steps or measures in ensuring uh, marine, marine biodiversity con um, conservation as not be used within our waters, that somehow we will connect also to whatever lies beyond national jurisdiction. 
So I think that that is the uh, um, uh, third challenge that I would like to uh, uh, put forward. And as a conclusion, again, uh, please allow me to uh, quote from uh, the uh, Betcher and uh, Elson's book. Um, the final chapter of the book um, here uh, reflects uh, what, uh, prof what is the concern of Professor Mohtar when he returned from Montego Bay. Uh, Professor Mohtar told the reporters at that time when he was interviewed that while Indonesians had every reason to be pleased with international recognition of the archipelagic principle, the next problem was to take full advantage of what Indonesia had gained. And in some ways, this challenge has been far more difficult than the archipelagic campaign itself. So I think um, uh, in, in, on that account, I would like to propose that to strengthen Indonesia's maritime diplomacy, I think at least we have to uh, consider um, external um, factors that we um, don't only have to deal with the uh, conventional issues um, arising from uh, being the largest archipelagic state, such as um, delimiting maritime boundaries, but also we have to deal with these non-traditional or non-conventional issues, such as how can we, as, um, as the largest archipelagic state, deal with the uh, current uh, uh, non-traditional maritime security challenges, and how can we also contribute to the uh, uh, sustainable development of our seas. And internally, I think we need also to uh, strengthen our policy and regulations. Um, we have now the um, coordinating ministry for the maritime affairs and investment. Although in uh, the last two years, I think the focus have been uh, more shifted to the, the handling of the pandemic. And uh, it, it is still um, questionable whether we can come up again with our um, strengthening our vision as the uh, global maritime fulcrum, which was declared by the, uh, um, our president back in 2014. And I think um, finally, um, all of us here are involved in the uh, uh, discourses on the law of the sea as uh, lawyers uh, and also as educators and researchers. And I think uh, it is our responsibility as well as, um, uh, as an educator myself, not only as a lawyer, to ensure that we have, um, we can maintain this um, future generations that have uh, interests in advancing our interests as the largest archipelagic state to continue, of course, the legacy of uh, Professor Motar, Subhan Maja, as well as Ambassador Arturo M. Tolentino. Thank you for your kind attention. I will be happy to take up questions. Well, thank you very much, Pa Guzman. Very comprehensive uh, explanations about the current situations. As I uh, may note that the, we found that the archipelagic state is actually an illegal creativity because as the, you open with the conversations <laughs> that we cannot be too normative probably. So you're seeing only in the legal perspective because you also have to see the other way, uh, the other situations uh, around that. And, and then we realized that the current issues is not only about the, um, the physical attack of to 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 the territory, which was was probably the considerations of Professor Moftar at the time. But now we have more difficult challenges, which is uh, to maintain not only about the boundaries, but how to main, uh, manage how to maintain uh, what it's with the waters, uh, the ecological connectivity, the sea level rise, which is out of our control <laughs> that we cannot stop. And, and Pagusan also show us uh, what the challenges have been faced in Indonesia is about the internal matters about the bureaucracies and institutions puzzling, probably if I may say so, because we have so many institutions dealing with this, uh, with, with these issues, but when we talk to this institution, then the institution, the institution A say, oh, that will be the job of institution B. And then we go to the B, oh, that will be C, and et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, maybe Dr. Bautista can also give uh, um, descriptions. Is it also happen in the Philippines or how? Because I think it's not on regarding to the management of the, on the uh, law of the sea, but also in any, any matters. When I was working for disaster management, it's also uh, the same, both in, reg uh, in making regulations, policy, and also implement implementing uh, uh, implement implementations. Okay, now is the questions and answer uh, sessions, uh, discussions. Uh, we have um, from Melbourne Law School. Oh, thank you very much. We have audience from Melbourne Law School. And do we have some uh, somebody in the chat? Okay, I will let, uh, oh, I, sorry, I cannot see your name. From Melbourne Law School, please. Uh, uh, you can start your questions. 
Hi, hi, hi. Um, uh, my name is Alex Fidela Cruz, and I am a doctor, doctoral student at uh, Melbourne Law School. Um, I would like to thank um, our uh, presenters, our excellent presenters to today, um, Professors Ko uh, Guzman and uh, Bautista, for for their um, um, illuminating accounts of, of the archipelago um, in international law. Um, and um, as a doctoral student here, I am I, I am interested in in the questions uh, of of the ways in which um, as uh, to, to borrow from Dr. Bautista, the archipelago is not an innocent legal concept. That, that's like, that's exactly my 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 interest. And um, to 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 echo what um, Professor Guzman has said, um, um, when 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 we talk about archipelagos, most inevitably we default to the position of talking about it from the standpoint of sovereignty. And um, to that, I, I would add that when we are talking about sovereignty, um, a lot of what contributes to looking at the archipelago as an innocent legal concept is um, the concern about defense and national security. Um, and so perhaps what I wanted to ask is to what extent did figures like Mokhtar and Tolentino acknowledge the contemporary context of their claims on the archipelagic doctrine during the, the years that these claims were being made. And so for the Philippines in 1955, when it, when it issued that, that um, diplomatic note um, stating you know, the, 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 the archipelagic unity of all islands and waters in the Philippines, the, the government in Manila was dealing with peasant rebels in central Luzon, north of Manila, and Moro rebellions in the island of Mindanao to the south of the Philippines. And for Indonesia in 1957, the government in Jakarta was dealing with the Permesta rebellion in Sulawesi. And so perhaps what I was wanting to hear was um, what, how much did they recognize the extent to which the archipelagic concept was also a device to consolidate in Indonesian and Philippine sovereignty over islands that were hotbeds of resistance to the idea of an intrinsic geographical, economic, political, and historical entity. Because not everyone is in the same boat. When we, when we try to force the idea that there's, there's an intrinsic entity, and this is language that appears in Article 46 of the Law of the Sea Convention, when we define the archi archipelago. And so I was wondering if beyond the sovereignty as national security and defense, were they also um, looking at what was happening in the islands that that constituted the putative archipelago. Okay, thank you. Oh, I see so many uh, hands, <laughs> and I see so many uh, people who want to ask in the chat box. Probably I will just let the uh, for this session I will let three persons who uh, who, uh, who deliver the question directly, and the next uh, I will take three questions from the chat box. Uh, uh, so I will just collect the second one. I will ask uh, Ilona to raise the question, please. Okay. Um. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Thank you, Bu Chlorin, for the opportunity. My name is Ilona. I'm a third semester student at Faculty of Law and My question is for uh, Pagusman. Hello, Pagusman. Okay, so uh, what Prof Tommy have mentioned before that the success diplomacy opens up so many opportunities for Indonesia to take advantage in national development. And if we look back, uh, they cannot be achieved without the support of the national consensus, such as a national regional coordination committee, or we call it uh, Pankor Wilnas, which coordinated all government agencies and other stakeholders at that time. But for right now, uh, Pankor Wilnas is considered no longer suitable to be able to handle the marine problems. And I'm wondering, uh, why did this happen? And are there any government's considerations in legal perspective to create another national body that can possibly replace the Pankor Wellness to strengthening the, the Indonesian's marine opportunity as an archipelagic state. Thank you. Thank you, Elona. I think I would let the next uh, opportunity to, I'm sorry if I'm not, uh, if I misspell, uh, Itat Aung Kiao. Yeah. 
Hello, are you there? Uh, is that uh, Ted Aung Kiao? Would you like to ask a question directly to the speakers? Okay, yeah. I would like to ask a question. Um, uh, good morning uh, from Lima. Uh, my name is Tao Jo. I am a fourth year LLB law student from University of Macquarie. And I would like to ask the question that how do we protect my uh, marine biodiversity uh, beyond areas of national jurisdiction? Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the trick uh, three. Uh, uh, the audience will ask the question. So I will let uh, uh, Dr. Bautista first to answer the questions. Thanks, Florine. Um, and uh, thank you, Alex, from Melbourne Law School for that really excellent, very insightful question. I know that um, Alex is um, writing his dissertation on this topic. So I, I, much as I would like to offer my personal views, uh, I would perhaps defer to his thoughts. But uh, since you asked the question, I think um, much of the debate, including the literature and the accounts are uh, really very statist in um, uh, orientation and also very Westphalian in, um, in uh, I mean, it assumes a unitary state. So if you, if you are looking for the discordant voices, the other voices, the opposing voices, those are, of course, drowned out because they will not be able to capture that. And and uh, from a foreign policy perspective, of course, you you uh, you know you sit, you participate, you advocate uh, in the negotiating table based on a uh, on clear instructions. And of course, those instructions uh, do not necessarily by you know by uh, design. Uh, they 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 will not be able to capture every interest, every uh, um, uh, perspective. So I agree with your point. I think uh, the, the archipelagic concept as a, as a unitary, a le a legal, a juridical concept really uh, it, um, codifies a legal fiction and also, of course, glosses over a factual, I mean, it, it assumes that it's a factual, uh, exist, it's factually existing, which may or may not happen from a sociological perspective. Because as you say, uh, if you look at it from a tableau of history, of course, there will be points in history where the unitary state as a, as, a, as, a, as a whole did not exist as we know it today. And, and, and that will be true for all, you know, all nations, not just, archipel not just archipelagos. So I think it's, the point is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, is um, excellent, but it's also um, uh, unfair because sometimes uh, it, it is looking for things which uh, will not be there because uh, as I said, it, it, it will be too much to ask for to, to, to look at that. Plus, um, although, as I said, the, the, the concept is not innocent, I think um, if we look at it from a, from a juridical or legal perspective, from a normative perspective, then uh, it makes our lives more simple. And in doing that, we, are, um, uh, we avoid the, 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 periphery, the peripheral questions which you, which you raise very, very excellently. So, um, your question actually asked how how did they uh, w did the uh, Tolentino or Mokhtar or Professor Tomiko uh, account for all of these uh, discordant or opposing voices? I don't think they they did. They ever did. And uh, uh, as diplomats, they it would be too much to ask of them to to do this. Uh, and and of course, uh, uh, secessions occur. There are also um, uh, uh, unrest. There are, even up to now, they still exist. So unfortunately, the text of the convention, the spirit of the convention and the negotiating history, unfortunately, I have the commentary that, uh, I have the whole set of the commentary that Professor Tomiko uh, mentioned. It will, I, I don't find it there. It will not be there because uh, it will be just too much to capture all of that. I think I'll just answer clearly in the first question. The second question is for um, uh, Professor Guzman and also the third. I think it's more appropriate for Professor Guzman as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bautista. Pa Guzman, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, if I may also a uh, little bit, uh, I have a little comment also uh, to a question from um, Alex. Um, I think the, yeah, the, the, what we can see, the, the reflection of uh, sovereignty is, is 
I think it's very obvious uh, on the uh, uh, part four of the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, and if I may uh, add, um, Professor Mohtar, uh, the, the conversa um, uh, conversation that I uh, um, uh, presented earlier uh, in, the, in the first slide, um, there was a, this also notion of uh, the uh, national security uh, from uh, Khairul Saleh at that time about the uh, uh, threats of um, uh, insurgencies uh, within Indonesia's islands. So I think the, the political interests are also one of the major drivers for uh, Indonesia, especially to uh, put forward its uh, archipelagic uh, state concept. And it has been successfully uh, included under uh, Article 46B, uh, uh, which says that um, there is an intrinsic economic and political entity. So I think uh, the uh, issue of uh, this kind of bringing together all the um, uh, society, um, islands and uh, people uh, within the archipelago is I think reflected uh, by that uh, uh, political entity. And it's one of the, the, the main drivers, I think also uh, on considerations for Indonesia to come up uh, with uh, archipelago state concept in the first place. And uh, second question from uh, Ilona, I, I think uh, Pankon Wilnas, yeah, they, they, they have uh, so much role in uh, Indonesia's negotiation. Um, now I think the situation has been, uh, has changed uh, uh, quite uh, significantly, um, if I may, uh, because of these kind of uh, new challenges um, uh, ahead of us. Um, I uh, mentioned uh, slightly um, during my presentation that back in 2014, um, a, uh, our president, Indonesia's president, announced this uh, concept of Indonesia as a global maritime fulcrum at that time. And we had so much hope at that time that um, finally, or uh, yeah, at, uh, at, uh, at last, uh, Indonesia uh, put more focus or attention on the uh, national development on uh, its um, oceans or, or seas. Uh, and so uh, we have also this uh, ministry, uh, coordinating ministry for uh, maritime affairs and investment, which I think uh, during its first um, initial years um, had been very active in, uh, and uh, in fact, it uh, has also been successful in uh, put uh, in uh, uh, publishing uh, uh, the uh, Indonesia's uh, national ocean policy uh, back in 2017. And now, of course, the question is that um, uh, how should we then uh, implement the, uh, the the policy? Because uh, the policy has been uh, so uh, comprehensive; it's still um, uh, is, is very much. Um, uh, general and has to be uh, implemented in, in, in a detailed sense. Um, so the, one of the uh, uh, challenges that we have is uh, also with the uh, maritime agency uh, institutions that now we are also still uh, trying to establish this kind of uh, national fleet. Um, and I think this is also one of the key factors. Uh, if you if you ask about how can we strengthen uh, our uh, position as the largest archipelago state, uh, we can start with that. I think uh, to uh, agree on a kind of uh, national guiding um, principle, central organizing principle that uh, can bring uh, together all the elements of uh, maritime security agencies in uh, maintaining uh, uh, safety and security in Indonesia's archipelagic waters. And uh, the third question is from uh, Hiet Aung Kiao uh, about marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Well, um, it, it's still being discussed, but one of uh, the triggers um, of why the negotiation was necessary because we are still having so much um, international instruments in place with respect to uh, marine biodiversity. Um, we have so uh, we, we have also some instruments that uh, have already dealt with um, marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, but uh, mostly is still confined to um, fisheries. And we have, uh, for instance, um, uh, other 
emerging issues such as um, marine genetic resources and then how can we ensure that we can also implement um, environmental impact assessment beyond national jurisdiction because as we know uh, largely the uh, EIA uh, is conducted within a national jurisdiction so there is a need to coordinate uh, between states and also to um, establish uh, standards or principles how can we um, uh, preserve uh, and also uh, conserve our uh, marine environment beyond national jurisdiction we don't have the agreement now uh, it's still being discussed and I, I mentioned uh, due to the pandemic it's been postponed um, and uh, the last that I uh, read from the um, uh, UN uh, was that it will be postponed until uh, 2022. Um, initially, it was planned um, uh, last August, uh, but uh, it didn't happen because uh, the pandemic is still here. So I hope that answers uh, the questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm ex uh, or we can overwhelm and exhausted because so many people want to ask, <laughs> even though I'm not the speaker, so has to answer. <laughs> okay, I will let the audience from the chat box. I will let uh, Sharif, Arifania, and Kunto to ask the question directly to the speakers. Sharif. Yes. Uh, thank you, Miss, for uh, the opportunities. So, uh, good day, sir, uh, Prof. Usman and Dr. Bautista. Uh, I have uh, some question here, and I am interested in the topic of national maritime security. Uh, I saw in your slide earlier, sir, Prof. Guzman, uh, that around Indonesia waters, there are uh, still many threats and interfere with Indonesian maritime security. And in terms of uh, national maritime security, can maritime culture, or uh, as we know as uh, budaya maritim, uh, contribute to resolving maritime disputes and how effective is the influence of maritime security on national mar uh, marine security? Thank you, bro. Okay, thank you, Sharif. And next is Arifania. Thank you, Bu Chlorine, for the opportunity. Uh, good morning. Uh, so my name is Arifania. I'm a student in International Law Class D of Faculty of UNPAD, of Faculty of Law in UNPAD. Uh, taught by Budi Ajeng Kristianti. So I would like to ask a question to the lecturers, especially to Mr. Lowell, uh, Mr. Lowell Batista, about an issue that happens in Philippines as a maritime state. So I just read that poaching and illegal fisheries, including by foreign vessels, especially from China, happens in the most uh, important fisheries area in Philippines which we know that this kind of problem is happening in Indonesia as well. But aquaculture has developed to counterbalance the decline of the natural resource. Uh, but actually, it has negative ecological, uh, ecological effects, that is the, the disappearance of mangroves, or in Indonesia, it's called hutan bakau. So the question is, is that solution is solutive for the problem? Or what do you think Philippines should do to resolve the poaching and illegal fisheries problem without impacting the uh, nature of mangroves? So thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Rifania. Now we have Kunto, please Kunto. Okay, uh, thank you for this opportunity and before I get started, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Muhammad Kunto Tribowo, and I'm from International Law Class D. And uh, secondly, I will uh, greetings Mr. Uh, Guzman Swandi and Dr. Bautista. Good morning, sir. And permission to ask you that if we look at the current condition right now, where the world is experiencing globalization and the climate warming, and it will cause problems such as a ri uh, rising sea levels. And this is the potential to cause like uh, the land area to shrink. So uh, my first question is, how can um, the law of the sea itself solve this problem? Maybe uh, uh, by perspective national law in Indonesia and or maybe uh, the international law of the sea itself. And uh, my second question is, because we know that for the example, sea lines are measured by the shoreline. Uh, and if that is the case, whether sea level rise will affect the reach of the country, for example, in terms of the Territorial sea, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is 12 mils, or the economic zone of exclusion, correct me if I'm wrong, is 200 mils. So, uh, will this phenomenon 
uh, the rise of the sea level will affect or have an impact of the narrowing of the area of this country itself. Uh, maybe enough for my question. Thank you for this opportunity. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, all the undergraduate students, but very brilliant questions. I will let Guzman first to respond to the questions, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Bu Gloria, and thank you for the questions. Uh, I think from uh, Sharif, yeah, uh, it's about the um, how uh, perhaps the uh, uh, culture of the, uh, or perhaps local wisdom of the uh, people um, in the island of the archipelago can also help to uh, uh, contribute to the, the uh, marine, uh, maritime security. Well, um, in this sense, I think, um, there are two that comes uh, to my mind. Uh, first, I think it's with respect to the um, uh, enforcement. Um, so um, in some discussions with the uh, uh, maritime, Indonesian maritime agencies, um, we uh, often uh, find that um, the officers are also um, assisted by the local people when they spot um, something uh, that uh, could be could lead to the um, um, infringement of our laws, for instance, like um, illegal fishing, uh, drug smuggling, etc. So um, the especially the the, the uh, water police, the water police and uh, the navy, as well as the Indonesian Coast Guard, they maintain this kind of um, um, uh, communication and also to um, uh, develop the community or, or the people in uh, some of the uh, um, islands uh, notorious for um, any uh, criminal um, actions or um, criminal acts with respect to our uh, marine environment. And uh, they have been assisting um, our um, uh, officer, officials um, uh, very uh, significantly. So I think that that's one of the uh, aspect of how uh, local people can um, contribute yeah, to, to the uh, maintenance of uh, maritime security. And uh, secondly, I think uh, we can also talk in terms of the uh, protection and uh, preservation of the marine environment. Um, we have uh, some uh, local tribes in uh, Indonesia who um, have maintained this kind of practice in um, preserving and uh, uh, protecting the resources of the marine environment in the eastern uh, Indonesia part, uh, such as in uh, Maluku, they have this uh, practice called sasi, um, which is actually the um, uh, when to harvest the uh, um, uh, fisheries in a certain uh, uh, se uh, seasons. Uh, and then uh, there are also a, a similar practice in uh, Lombok, the uh, um, southern part of uh, Indonesia's archipelago, and also in uh, Aceh, the, in the uh, uh, northern, one of the northernmost part of the uh, province of Indonesia. So yeah, I, I agree that uh, we the, the community involvement, um, maritime culture uh, within our uh, society uh, can help also to contribute to the maintenance of maritime security. And a uh, uh, question from Punto, um, what I can say is that the, uh, now um, we are, we're still also discussing this uh, impact of uh, sea level rise um, on uh, our baselines. There, there is, um, uh, the, you can um, perhaps also uh, read the reports from the uh, also ILA committee. Uh, they have established these committees to deal with um, not only the impact um, of sea level rise on um, baselines, but also the um, uh, human dimension of, of, of the sea level rise. Uh, there is also the question of um, human rights, um, uh, the, the displacement of people who have to uh, move away, uh, forced to leave because of the uh, sea level rise. Uh, that's also a question that has been addressed by the uh, ILA community. And currently, the International Law Commission also is still working on the uh, principles with respect to uh, uh, the impact of uh, climate change and sea level rise on the law of the sea. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bautista, please. Thank you, Florine. Uh, really excellent um, questions from the undergrad. I'm very impressed. So happy to uh, hear them and also happy to address them very quickly. So the first one addressed to me is from Arivania. So the question is, how does the Philippines, what should the Philippines do to address poaching, illegal fishing, uh, and balancing that with the, the risk of um, damaging aquaculture and so on? So I think this is also um, partly responded to by Dr. Professor Guzman. So it's really a question of coordination and also enforcement. 
if you look at the Philippine uh, domestic le uh, legisla legislation, there, there's um, enough laws. I think we have fish fisheries laws. Also, the same as uh, Florian was asking uh, at the start of the open forum, we have enough um, enforcement agencies as well. So a lot of this happens within the domestic sphere, but also in the trilateral uh, area where uh, massive illegal IU fishing occurs in the Sulu, Sulu West Seas and also in the South China Sea, unfortunately. So domestically, the, the, there should be enforcement coordination. And uh, if it involves, um, you know, trilateral issues or other states, then coordination is required. I want to address as well Kunto's point, very, um, very, very uh, insightful question, because um, it really, it re um, the response of Professor Guzman is spot on because there, there, it's a, it's a, it's a legal conundrum. So you look at the ILA. There's a study group that addresses that. The ILC. Uh, I'm just reminded because uh, you know uh, the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated in, in the 1960s over a span of uh, you know decades. It's a, it's an old uh, treaty of vintage origin. It's old. It's like if you if you look at Kunto's question, it's looking at sea level rise, disappearance of islands. It's like asking your grandfather to do TikTok because this is a, this is an old treaty. So imagine at that time they ne they never they never imagined sea level rise, uh, b b biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So there are new, more newer laws or treaties in the international sphere which addresses this in triple C and another. Uh, I mean, it's not to say that there's deficiency in the treaty itself because it's called the constitution of the oceans. But there are some aspects which they never Im imagined or envisioned at that time. So um, I think in, in, in the response to Kunto's question, there are two views to this, because a sea level rise, there could be uh, what they call ambulant uh, or moving the base, uh, base points or baselines. So the, the baselines could move. So uh, Kunto is very uh, smart. He mentioned 12 nautical mass, 12 nautical mass. So the first view is you would move the base points or baselines as the water level rise or they're crystallized or they, they remain as is. So, of course, we don't know that yet because, uh, I mean, the, the state of law is, 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 in, uh, is uncertain, but uh, there, are, there are scholars and uh, um, um, uh, people who, who fall on the other side. So it's either that the baselines or base points adjust, and the same is true for disappearing islands. So it could be that... Uh, even if they don't meet the criteria for statehood, as you would know, if you look at the Montevideo Con Con Convention, their criteria, their territory, and so on, if they don't meet that anymore, they cease to exist, which is the first perspective, or they still remain to exist uh, despite losing territory. So it's it, we have yet to see how this will pan out because it's it's a it's a uh, it's it's a very uh, dynamic area of law at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. I still see so many uh, hands and so many questions, but unfortunately, unfortunately, we have a limited of time. We're running out of time. It's the end of the of our discussion time. I'm so sorry, audience. Maybe we will have a, a discussion in other uh, opportunities. But the, for the undergraduate students, we, we can uh, have more discussions on our class. And also, I also invite you to the class of International Law of the Sea with Pa Guzman. <laughs> so, the lecturer and me will be there probably if he's still invited to the class. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, before we close the, the discussion, I would like to, uh, the presenters, Pa Guzman and uh, Dr. Bautista, to deliver some uh, closing remarks probably for the discussions. Uh, maybe I will uh, let uh, Dr. Bautista first. Thanks, Chlorine. Uh, again, I would like to um, reiterate my appreciation uh, and uh, um, my uh, honor and privilege to join you today. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm also envious that Indonesia has an, in the, in, an ILA branch. I think the, the first and only, I think in ASEAN, uh, Singapore might have one. So. Congratulations to uh, the ILA Indonesia branch for organizing this wonderful, excellent uh, uh, dialogue. And also uh, I, 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 am, I am one with you in honoring Professor Mokhtar for his contributions. And also um, I invite you to uh, you know, do further readings because the law of the sea is very exciting. I'm speaking to the undergrad, not just the, the lawyers. Uh, we, we are in need of you because uh, uh, as Professor Guzman also mentioned and Professor Tomiko, Succession is very important because we need a, a fresh blood, new generation of leaders, thought uh, leaders. Uh, so I'm happy to see young faces uh, and, and, and really uh, the questions are indicative of uh, you know, how excellent you are. So you're, you're receiving good education in Indonesia. 
and uh, um, uh, I look forward to other opportunities to um, speak with you and all the best. I know we're in the middle of the pandemic, so keep safe. Uh, and uh, I wish you, uh, you know, um, I, I wish that you keep well and that we uh, keep a, a positive spirit and hopefully we will weather this pandemic as well and we will be able to see each other in person uh, when, when that uh, opportunity presents itself in the future. Terima kasih banyak and uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Terima kasih banyak, Dr. Lowell Bautista from the University of Wollongong, our expert from the Philippines, the young Arturo Tolentino. <laughs> I will head to Guzman, the young Mohtar Guzman Atmaja, probably to deliver some closing remarks. Uh, thank you. I'm so flattered. Uh, but uh, if you allow me, uh, Bu Clorin, before I uh, have my uh, uh, open closing uh, statement, uh, I would like to address a question here from uh, my colleague uh, Pak Eka from uh, UNISBA. Uh, he, uh, he raised a question about uh, the role of Mr. Khairul Saleh. So I just would like to uh, perhaps elaborate a little bit that yeah, it, it was him uh, who encouraged uh, Prof. Mohtar to come up with these um, radical ideas. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, Prof. Mohtar um, did not do something that, that was contrary to international, but he in fact has contributed to uh, the development of uh, international law. And it was at this point also uh, Prof. Motar uh, was having his uh, sanctuary in, in Bandung uh, to study this uh, case of Anglo-Norwegian fisheries back in 1951. And that was one of the uh, uh, phenomenal uh, case that, that inspired him to finally come up with um, archipelagic uh, state uh, concept. And I just uh, would like to uh, second uh, my colleague, uh, Prof. Lower Bautista about the uh, uh, succession of the uh, new uh, generation of uh, the law of the sea people. So I think now uh, we have secured our rights um, as an archipelagic state. We can enjoy our sovereignty, sovereign rights. Uh, we can ensure also the navigation rights of other states. I think now is the the era to finally uh, move on to the um, how can we also as an archipelagic state contribute to the maintenance of uh, peaceful and security of our oceans. And that's a huge task, but I believe that with um, this discussion as a start, uh, thank you uh, for my colleagues at the uh, uh, ILA Indonesian branch, uh, Professor Atif uh, for and all of uh, my colleagues for uh, this very um, insightful moment. Uh, I think it's a time we can um, uh, pull our acts together and uh, together we can, uh, I think, respond to the uh, challenges ahead uh, on the law of the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pak Guzman. Yes, I think we are one heart because I'll, at, at first I would like to address the question from Pak Eka, but, and then you initiatively answer it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, presenters Pak Guzman, Dr. Bautista, it's very nice to have you here to share your thoughts uh, with the students and all the audience also. Our colleagues, uh, Ibu Priscilla from UNSRAT ACU here, and uh, as Ibu, uh, Ibu Adi, uh, Ibu Diana, uh, Professor Eti, Professor Mika, thank you very much for your participation in this room but uh, i think uh, it's the end of the uh, of the discussion but before that i will deliver this to renata because we have some kind of uh, another uh, pro uh, protocol to be to be followed thank you very much once again for all the participation i feel more enthusiastic to learn about the international law of the sea uh, uh, and, I, I, and i see uh, there are so many students also who feel enthusiastic to learn about this issue thank you very much again assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Rere, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Ibu Kloyan. We would like to express our gratitude and appreciation to speakers, discussants, and also participants. And of course, Ibu Kloyan for chairing this session. It is an honor for having all the speakers here. Once again, thank you very much, Professor Ati Platipul Hayat, Professor Tomiko, Mr. Lowell Bautista, PhD, Mr. Guzman Siswani, PhD, and also our deepest gratitude to Professor Mika Koma, Professor Eti R. Agus, lecturers, and all the students in this international lecture. And as an appreciation, we would like to give certificates to all the speakers, which will be given by Professor Atip Latipul Hayat as the president of International Law Association Indonesian branch. Professor Atip Latipul Hayat, the screen is yours. Um, thank you, uh, Renata. 
I'm sorry because of the technical problems, so I lost my connections with this uh, room. <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank my uh, uh, appreciations to uh, Dr. Uh, Bautista from University of Bolongo and my colleague, uh, Dr. Guzman. We are the Australian Connections. Yeah, I know uh, Wollongong University has a strong research in uh, law of the sea and maritime law. And uh, also Pa Guzman from the Australian National University and I'm from Monash University. So our discussion is dominated by uh, Australians uh, Connections Bo Orin. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> and thank you very much for all participants for this uh, very productive discussions. And one of the most important uh, conclusions, uh, Professor Mokhtar has uh, taught us that uh, we don't bridge law, especially international law, in uh, uh, our proposings, our ideas, our interests, national interests, but we have to make new law. We have to uh... Professor Apit, oh, um, we would like to apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I'm afraid that um, there is a problem with Professor Atip's connection. Uh, to Ibu Christianti, would you like to uh, take over the screen, please? Okay. Um, okay, since we have a problem with the connections of Professor Atip, I have to take over the closing uh, remarks from him as a, a representative from the ELA Indonesian branch. Uh, so again, I would like to say uh, thank you for all the presenters, pa, uh, pa Guzman and also Dr. Bautista for your time, for sharing with us a very uh, thoughtful and um, impressive uh, discussions about the law of the sea. Thank you so much for your time. From I also very happy, especially for Dr. Bautista, who's very welcome when I invite invited you from the very beginning to join this uh, session. So thank you very much. I hope we can uh, also uh, have a, a further cooperations between uh, ILA Indonesian branch and also the University of Wollongong. And also for the Vice Dean, Pa Guzman, thank you so much again for your time. And I know that you also have another meeting in uh, 10.50, if I'm not mistaken. So I hope we can finish the session on time. And again, for the participation, for the participants, thank you so much for your participation, for your participation and for your time. Okay, Renata, I give you the screen. Thank you, Ibu Christianti. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the productive session and we look forward to more exciting discussions in the future. I'm Renata, as your master of ceremony, would like to say thank you very much for being present today. I wish you a great day ahead. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Shanti, 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 Om. Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. A very good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.